Blood Price, Blood Immortal Series Book 1, by Ava Benton. Prologue. Years ago, more like centuries and centuries ago, there a new strain of vampires was brought to creation. Night Wardens, they were called by those who knew of their existence. A Night Warden's mission was simple. Guard the high sorceress he was assigned to until needed no longer, then return back to his place deep within the earth, a place called the Fold. A new high sorceress would come to power every so often among the covens. Some covens were fortunate enough to have night wardens to keep them safe. These night wardens were bodyguards in essence, except they were bodyguards without a choice. Bound by the blood of the one they were charged with protecting, the night wardens were faithful, monastic, and unemotional. Or so it was thought. No one counted on the emotions that would arise in these creatures that walk the dark and protect the sorceresses that wield power. Chapter 1 Elias I would never forget the first time I tasted Vanessa's blood. Deep in the caves, far under the mountains. Away from humans and others of our kind. Even far away from animals. While in the fold, we couldn't run the risk of being discovered. We were too vulnerable. Not that anybody could get to us. A member of one of the witch covens might be able to, maybe, and she'd have to be an exceptionally powerful witch to get through the layers of protection placed on our cells. Even so, sometimes I wondered whether the spells were in place to protect us, or to ensure we couldn't escape before our time was up. Maybe we would try to get back to our charge, the one we had guarded until we were forced back to the fold. While there was rarely any love lost between a night warden and his charge, a man didn't spend years and years, decades, sometimes more than a century guarding another creature without something happening. Some sort of connection. I had yet to feel such a connection with my current charge, Vanessa. I fought the grimace that was making its way to my face. All of this went through my head as I navigated the maze that was Vanessa's penthouse. Room after room, laid out without much concern for design or usefulness. What drug was the architect on when he or she designed it? It was like something out of a fevered dream. I could still vaguely recall those from back in the old days, the pre-turning days. When I was a young man, not a vampire yet. A boy by the standards of current society, of course. A society which coddled the young. I would probably be in college at that age, if I had been born several hundred years later. Getting drunk stoned laid. I couldn't normally stand the sight or even the thought of those lazy, entitled college bros, that was the term, wasn't it? But just then, as I collected Vanessa, it didn't sound like such a bad life. Better than the life I had now. I rapped on her closed bedroom door with the backs of my knuckles. Vanessa. Everyone will be waiting. Just when I thought she couldn't get any more insufferable, she pulled something like this. Cressida would have my skin if Vanessa missed any single part of the ceremony. It would make her look bad, and that was the thing Cressida hated worst. Vanessa. I went from rapping to banging. Hard. Still no answer. I grit my teeth and wondered how much my charge would mind if I broke down her bedroom door. I took three steps back and was about to find out when the door swung open. You're feeling very dramatic today, she sighed, eyes rolling hard. As always, I had to bite back my irritation. And you're feeling extremely deaf. Or just rude. Which is it? I guess I didn't hear you. She brushed past me on her way down the hall, and I could have easily reached out and strangled her. It would have been a pleasure. Something I had been fantasizing about for as long as I had known her. From the moment my eyes opened to the taste of her blood, and she looked down at me with a knowing, arrogant look. Vanessa wasn't my first witch, and she wouldn't be my last, but none of the witches I had previously imprinted on and guarded looked at me that way. Like they had a servant. Are you ready to go? I asked, following her to the front room. That, at least, was beautiful. She liked to host parties in there. The windows looked out over Central Park, and in the late afternoon, with the day's last beams of amber sunlight streaming down and turning the autumn treetops into a blaze of color, 
It was a gorgeous sight. A sight that stirred memories deep in my mind. I had always loved that time of year, and I had seen so many autumns come and go. Just about. You know it's important for me to look good tonight. And that was as close to an apology as I would ever get from her. I knew I should count myself lucky to get even that much. I'm sure none of them will care what you look like, I muttered, leaning against the front door, still looking across the room to that view of the outside. I could recall when Central Park was nothing more than a dirt lot, considered too far uptown to even be bothered with. You don't know much about women, do you? She winked as she checked herself out in the mirror one more time. She owned a lot of mirrors. Her waist-length black hair shimmered as she fluffed it with both hands. For someone who's been alive as long as you, I would think you would have picked up a few things. I've picked up enough, I growled, then shut down. I was never much for conversation anyway, and we were getting nowhere. The fact was, no matter how she tried to blow off a coven meeting, no matter how hard she tried to be flippant over anything of real importance, I could feel her apprehension. Her anxiety. The shell of carelessness she had worked so hard to perfect over the years concealed a deep pit of insecurity. Her silvery eyes flashed at me when she turned away from the mirror. She felt the direction my thoughts had traveled in. Let's go already. I thought we were in a hurry. I barely held back a sigh as I opened the door for her. She sashayed down the hall to the elevator in a pair of jeans so tight they could have been painted on. Cressida would take issue with that. Witches weren't supposed to draw human eyes to themselves. Vanessa's argument that humans dressed that way all the time and therefore her outfits weren't outside the norm actually made sense. Fashion certainly had changed over the centuries. The car was waiting when we reached street level, and already the sky had begun to darken overhead. Night came on more quickly every day at this time of year. Another reason I enjoyed it. The driver pulled away from the curb without instruction, already knowing where we were headed. A driver not in use by the coven would question why we'd want to travel to a rundown neighborhood, where rows of abandoned buildings sat and rotted. Trash littered the sidewalks, bottles, wrappers, used condoms and needles on the corners where the prostitutes and drug peddlers did their business. Nobody in their right mind would take a Lexus into that part of town, unless they planned on getting carjacked or worse. I pitied the fool who tried to steal our car. Even so, knowing what I knew, it didn't thrill me to step out of the car in front of the decaying mansion in question. Glass crunched under the heel of my boot as I climbed out, my head on swiveling and assessing our surroundings. The razor-sharp dagger sat in the holster on my belt, and I slid a hand under my open trench to rest my fingers on the carved handle. A vampire with a dagger, perhaps a rarity, but not surprising, considering that this dagger was precious to me. Hundreds of years old, it was a present long, long ago, specially handcrafted for me, every character etched into it was designed for only one person. Me. I'd been extremely adept with my dagger before I'd been turned into a vampire, and my affinity for blades still continued. And the weight of my coat, was a testimony to my fondness for weapons. Coast is clear, I muttered. One high-heeled boot emerged from inside the Lexus. Then another. Vanessa stood, unfolding her lean body as gracefully as a cat. She threw her hair over one shoulder and held out the carefully folded robe she'd brought with her. I'm a little too busy to carry your robes, I growled as I closed the door. She scoffed but followed me up the broken brick stairs which led to the front of the house. After all the time I'd spent as her night warden, she insisted on testing the limits of my patience. I wondered how she was managing the ruined brick walkway on her ridiculous heels. We stepped through the open front door just as the sky turned dark, open because there was no door left on the mansion, but only open to the naked human eye. No human could cross the threshold and only a witch of the Crescent Moon Coven, or one of their night wardens, were permitted thanks to the numerous spells and wards cast over it. It was like entering a different world. Gone was the ruin, visible to those who peered inside from the walkway. Inside, 
crystal chandeliers dating back to the mansion's early days cast an inviting glow throughout the foyer. The rich, polished wood lining the walls and the brass sconces dotting it called back to the Gilded Age when that sort of ornate decoration was common. When I looked down, I could see my reflection in the marble floor. You're finally here. Cressida's voice announced her irritated presence before the sight of her did. She rested one heavily ringed hand on the banister as she walked down the wide center staircase. Her robes gave the illusion that she floated, along with her natural grace. Something her daughter Vanessa had inherited. Vanessa barely hid her irritation as she shrugged out of her coat and into her robes. One of the coven's indentured servants, a human who had a spell cast on her, caught the coat as Vanessa dropped it. The servant moved toward me. I shook my head, declining her offer to take my coat. Even in the middle of the coven, I preferred having the weapons which lined the inside of my black trench coat close at hand. Sorry, sorry. Traffic. You know how it is. Vanessa kissed her mother's offered cheek before adjusting her deep purple robes. Cressida raised one jet-black eyebrow in response. Hum. And yet I made the drive down from the Catskills, but still managed to get here at a reasonable time. How interesting. I felt Vanessa's rage, which only masked her shame. Cressida had a way of bringing that up, but I guessed any mother knew how to push her daughter's buttons. I preferred to stay far away from their dramatics. Cressida turned to me. Elias. Good to see you again. And you, I said with a bow, hands clasped behind my back. I couldn't read her as easily as I did her daughter, since I had never imprinted on her, but I knew her graciousness wasn't sincere. As far as she and any other witch were concerned, I was not much more than a servant. Like the groveling little servants, who collected coats and offered refreshments during meetings of the coven. Come. The others have already gathered downstairs. With a dramatic sweep of her robes, Cressida led the way through the first floor. Vanessa silently seethed, for once I could almost understand why. She had come into power several years earlier, replacing her mother as high sorceress of the coven, but her mother still acted as though she were in charge. It would get to me, too. The older woman led the way down a stone staircase, followed by her seething daughter. I was careful to keep clear of Vanessa's long robes as they trailed behind her, while my eyes swept back and forth. Even though she was as safe as she would ever be in the heart of her coven, the instincts I had honed over years of service to other sorceresses just as powerful as Vanessa told me to keep watch. Perhaps none were quite as powerful as Vanessa, however. There was no other witch as powerful. Certainly not in her coven, at any rate, but I had experience with others which stretched back hundreds of years back to the old country. And I had never seen anyone like her. And she knew it. The other witches greeted her warmly, almost reverently. Don't encourage her, I thought with bitterness. She must have felt my thoughts and glanced at me with a sour expression before accepting the adoration of her coven. Now that we're all together and the moon is rising, let us go out to the garden, she announced. Is the circle in place? It is, one of the witches replied with an eager smile. Diana. Ass kisser. Vanessa couldn't stand her. Good. My charge smiled and led the way through the door which opened up onto the rear garden. As was the tradition in the old days, the garden was surrounded by a ten-foot-high brick wall, which allowed for privacy. After all, those living inside wouldn't want the common rabble who passed by on foot to enjoy the beauty they surrounded themselves with. A small wrought-iron door led to the desolation just outside the garden walls. I barely registered the presence of the many rose bushes in bloom all around me. They bloomed year-round anyway, thanks to the magic surrounding them. What I saw was a circle of lit candles, which Vanessa stepped into the center of. The rest of the coven, two dozen witches in all, stood along the perimeter of the circle and raised their arms, fingertips touching as the sleeves of their robes hung down to the ground. They formed what looked like a solid wall around their high sorceress, Vanessa, who raised the robe's hood over her head before tilting her face up to the rising moon. 
I had watched the ceremony before. It was the same at every full moon, when the coven got together and summoned the moon's inherent power to make their magic stronger and cleanse the energy which enveloped them. I was tired of it. The same invocations, the same chanting. It was all a big show as far as I was concerned. Finally, time to wrap it up. We thank you, goddess of the moon, for shining your divine light on us, Vanessa crooned, staring up at a completely unfeeling, unthinking rock which only reflected the light from earth. I stifled a yawn. Thank you, goddess, the witches chanted, swaying slightly. Thank you, Mother Moon. Each of the witches then bent to pick up a candle. I stepped aside, guarding the door as Vanessa led a procession back into the basement, where the rest of the meeting would take place. I waited until all of them were inside, before closing the door behind me. The candles sat on pillars lining the walls of the room. Vanessa's chair, practically a throne, sat at the far end. She lowered her hood and took her seat, while the others sat in a semi-circle of chairs arranged in front of her. Cressida sat in the first chair on Vanessa's right, while her sister Maria sat in the chair on the left. I took my customary place just a step or two behind the high back chair, watching the room. There's a piece of business I would like to bring up at the start of our gathering, Vanessa said, her voice rising. She was anxious. Determined. I could feel it as clearly as I could feel my own confusion. What was she about to say? She looked over all of them, one by one. I've spent the last two weeks poring over the ancient books which record the history of our great coven. I've read of the ancient ones, the old laws set forth by them. I've even read of the prophecies the wise seers set down in those days. I'm sure we're all aware of them, even if we've never read them ourselves. The talk of a great one, one who would lead the coven through millennia. Yes, yes, Cressida smiled, cutting her off. We're all well aware of these prophecies, high sorceress. Sorceresses throughout the ages have referred to them. Some even thought the prophecies referred to them and their reign. But we've all seen how easy it is to misinterpret a prophecy, as none of those sorceresses are ruling the coven today. You're correct, Vanessa said. I was surprised for a moment at how even she sounded. How smooth. She had anticipated her mother speaking up that way, of course. Because none of them were smart enough to understand the prophecy's true meaning and how to make it a reality. A murmur rose over the room. Please explain, Cressida said in a voice that towered over the others. Gladly. Vanessa stood, hands at her sides. Those hands were powerful. I had seen them do incredible things. I'd watched lightning bolts zigzag from her fingertips. I'd seen her part rivers, lift a train's engine fifty feet into the air and hurl it a half mile away. She could harness the wind, control fire, change her appearance at will. And she was young. Her power would only increase as she matured. For the time being, those powerful hands stayed at her side, but I felt energy crackling through her as she spoke. According to our ancient bylaws, it is not necessary for a high sorceress to relinquish power after a set amount of time or when the ruling ones deem so. That's a rule we set in motion ourselves after a lot of infighting and backbiting, centuries ago. Those witches are long since dead, but we still follow their rules. As high sorceress, I have the authority to bypass those rules and revert back to the original law, which I choose to do now. It took a second or two for the meaning of her words to sink in. You mean? Cressida murmured, eyes wide. I mean, I have no intention of relinquishing my position in the Crescent Moon Coven. Ever. Chapter 2 Maria Just like that, all hell broke loose. You can't be serious. My mother, I think she'd prefer to be called Cressida even by her daughters, sputtered as she almost leapt out of her chair. Her eyes flashed fire. This is outrageous. Vanessa stayed calm for once in her life. Remember who you're speaking to, she said, and her face was as emotionless as stone. I am your high sorceress. I deserve respect. My mother's, I struggled with calling her Cressida most days, 
face turned ten shades of red, and I could just see the wheels turning in her head as she imagined all the different ways she'd love to punish my sister. But Vanessa was a little too old to be taken over her knee and spanked. She had been too old for a long time, and way too powerful. Hi, sorceress, I said, stepping in between the two of them without thinking first. Just as I had been doing my whole life. This is a very serious declaration. You've dropped it on us all at once, without giving us time to process it. Vanessa's eyes softened, but just a little. They hardened again. How many times had I seen that stubborn look? She was born with it. You can process it however you want. In your own time. But it doesn't change the facts. Vanessa. I pleaded with her silently. We still had enough of a connection as blood sisters that we didn't always need to use words to understand each other. And I felt what was going on inside her. How unsure she was at her core and how determined she was to have her way. She'd always had her way. One of the pitfalls of being the most powerful witch born in centuries. She didn't know how to live life otherwise. You're all invited to go over the ancient texts, the way I did, she offered with a smile, looking out over the rest of the coven. I followed her gaze. A few of the witches looked happy. A few looked like they couldn't care less, since they would never be high sorceress anyway. Then there were the others. Those with exceptional powers, who had probably been scheming to take over after my mother stepped down. Vanessa was by far the youngest of us ever to take control, and they hadn't expected her to come into full power for another few decades at least. It wasn't nepotism, either. My mother had nothing to do with the process. Still they had hoped they would have their turn when the time came. If Vanessa got her way, they never would. She had to see what this would do to the coven. I looked at her again, silently begging her to calm down and rethink her crazy proclamation. All she did was dig her heels in deeper and double down. She always doubled down. If any of you have a problem with this, you're more than welcome to address it with me after you review the laws as I did, and after a majority of the coven reaches the same conclusion. Just don't expect me to change my mind because I'm in the right. She held her head high and let the chaos swirl around her. I don't think this is wise, I murmured just low enough for her to hear. Vanessa, stop this now. Think it over. Her eyes shifted and she looked down at me, but her face didn't move. The candles went out all at once, like a single breath had extinguished them. The ground started shaking under my feet. Vanessa, I growled under my breath as I fought to stay upright. My mother leaned on me, and I helped her find a chair as she stretched one arm out and relit the candles. Just another one of my sister's temper tantrums, though I had never seen her throw one of them in front of the coven before. I looked at her again, and the smug little smile she wore made me want to slap her until I couldn't raise my hand anymore. Spoiled little brat, I thought, shooting it her way. She didn't flinch. She was too busy enjoying the little bit of chaos she had just caused as witches got back on their feet and dusted off their robes. I glanced over at Elias, standing just behind Vanessa and to the left. He stood the way he always did, with his feet at shoulder width and his hands behind his back. Nothing about his stony expression told me what was going on in his head. What did he think about my sister's ridiculous announcement? Had she told him about it? No, she wouldn't. She loved the element of surprise, the drama. I always thought she should study acting. His ice-blue eyes, ringed in red the way all vampire eyes were, told me nothing as they stared straight ahead. Any other objections? Vanessa asked sweetly. We'll have a talk about this, our mother promised. Fair enough. I'll be happy to meet with you upstairs in the library. You can be the first to look over the texts if you want to. The coven parted as Vanessa made her exit, swishing her robes around like a little kid playing dress-up in front of a mirror. Acting the manner she thought a powerful witch should act, admiring her reflection. Elias followed her up the stairs, as always. 
Who does she think she is? My mother hissed, jumping to her feet. Please, mother. She shot me a pointed look. I gave in. Cressida. Let's calm down. I glanced around the room. Too many ears were listening, while their owners bent over backward to pretend they weren't. I persisted. We'll go upstairs and talk to her, and make her listen to reason. You know she always does, eventually. I don't know this time. I truly don't. My mother smoothed a few strands of gray-streaked black hair which had escaped her long, thick braid when she fell. It'll be all right. I hoped. I didn't know. But I hoped. I shot a few reassuring, if apologetic, smiles to my coven sisters as I crossed the floor. As always, I felt like I had to apologize for something Vanessa did. My burden. If I believed in karma, I'd have to wonder what I did to deserve her. My mother's shoes clicked on the floor as she marched to the library. So fast, I had to jog to keep up. Vanessa was in there, standing behind a podium on which a thick, dusty-looking book was lying open. Elias stood by one of the windows, emotionless. He had to think something about this. If Vanessa never stepped down, he would be by her side for as long as she lived, instead of going into stasis back in the Fold's underground caves. He had a stake in her decision, too. I wondered if he and Vanessa had exchanged any words before we got there, and told myself for the thousandth time that I thought too much about the two of them. Even so, I looked at him one more time before taking my place next to my mother, who glowered at my sister. What do you think you're doing? she hissed. I didn't bear you and raise you and train you for this, Vanessa. You did all those things in order for me to one day step into my power, which I've done. Vanessa shrugged her thin shoulders. I mean, what did you expect? Did you think I wasn't smart enough to look these things up for myself? Smart? Or devious? My mother asked. What's devious about making sure I know everything there is to know about my coven? About my place in it? About our history? I mean, you don't want me to walk around with my head up my ass, do you? It wouldn't look good for you, she added with a nasty grin. Ness. I whispered, shaking my head, hoping that using her nickname would snap her out of her power trip. She was playing with fire. My mother might not have been quite as powerful as Vanessa, but she would put a hurting on her if given the chance. And all she wanted right then was an excuse. Only the thought of what would happen if the High Council found out stopped her. It was a crazy situation, having to step down and let her daughter tell her what to do. I felt sorry for her. It wasn't fair for Vanessa to take advantage of her power. Vanessa sighed as she looked at me. Don't you ever get tired of playing the go-between? she asked. I mean, if you would get a life you would find out there are other things to do besides this. Rage started to simmer within me. I was no slouch either, and I wanted to shackle her in electric chains and throw her off a bridge. Maybe if you weren't always starting trouble, I wouldn't have to smooth things over for you, I hissed. Enough. Mother placed a hand on my arm, warning me to stop. Her head snapped around as she picked Elias's shape out of the shadows. You. Did you know about this? Excuse me? His voice was a deep rumble. You heard me, Nightwarden. Did you know what my daughter was doing when she traveled to and from this place to study these texts? He doesn't tell me what to do, Vanessa cut in. And even if he did, I wouldn't listen. He knows that. He cleared his throat. With all due respect, it isn't my place to advise the High Sorceress on her choice of reading material. I barely stifled a giggle and only managed it because I knew my mother would blow her top. She scoffed just like a vampire, never stepping up when you truly need him to. Mother, that's enough, I hissed. Maria's right for once, Vanessa agreed. For once. How cute. The only thing keeping me from slapping her was the fact that she agreed with me. Leave Elias out of this. This is between us, and the fact is, you can't handle knowing this isn't your coven to lead anymore. 
It's mine. I am the High Sorceress, and mother or not, it isn't your place to tell me what to do. If I were anyone else, you wouldn't dare face me this way. If you were anyone else, I wouldn't have to. My mother shook with rage as she turned away and swept out of the room. My heart sank. They would never understand each other, and I would always be in the middle. The way it had been for endless decades. I turned to my sister. Just give this a little more thought, all right? I've done all the thinking I plan to do, she fired back. And as usual, your logic is fine. Your approach is what you seriously screwed up. But way to go, pissing off most of the coven. It's not up to them. To tell you what to do. I know, I said, nodding. But it's up to you to keep the peace. Being a leader isn't all about sitting on a big chair or standing in the center of a circle. I wish you had grown up a little more and figured that out before your powers presented themselves. She glared at me, almost vibrating with energy, but only whispered, Is that all? Yes. That's all. My eyes found Elias one more time, I couldn't help myself, before I followed my mother out of the mansion and to the car out front. She had cast a protection spell on it, so to the untrained eye it only looked like a burned-out shell. The illusion fit in well in that neighborhood. Oh, I could kill her sometimes, mother fumed, arms crossed as the car pulled away. I don't feel comfortable going back to the house after that little performance of hers. I have the feeling things won't settle down for a long time. Maybe we shouldn't have left, I murmured. I needed to get out of there, she replied. But you could have stayed. No. I would have lost it if I stayed around much longer. I had to admit with a heavy sigh as I tugged my way out my robes in the car's confines. She'll always be Vanessa. A handful and a half. And more, my mother agreed. I don't mean to be so hard on her. You know that, right? Of course. It was a knee-jerk response, practiced over many years. Do you mind my company at your place? I would rather stay close. Of course, I said again. Another automated response. I had a spare room just for her at my Manhattan apartment. I had planned on heading back to my home in the Hamptons after the meeting, since I hadn't been out there in weeks, but that wasn't in the cards. All thanks to my sister. I imagined her leaving with Elias. Going home with him. And there I was, with my mother. Calming her down, as always. Just another reason for me to wish our roles were reversed. Chapter 3 Elias I guess you want to know what that was all about. Vanessa's voice was quieter than usual. Meeker. Not in the least. I looked out the window as the city raced past. You weren't surprised? Why should I have been? Nothing any of you do has anything to do with me. As long as I keep you out of harm's way, my job is done. I have too many things to consider without worrying about your business. I turned away from her to signal the end of the conversation and wished she would learn a little something from her sister. Maria was the level-headed one. Guarding her would have been a breeze. No. I ended up tethered to the impulsive one, the one who spoke first and thought later. However, I hope you didn't just make my job more difficult, I said with a growl. What's that mean? It means you might have made a few enemies back there. You might have to watch your back now, or rather, I might have to watch it for you. To say nothing of the fact that if she maintained power indefinitely, I would be stuck with her until the end of time. The thought of endless decades, centuries at her side made me sick. Oh, give me a break. And you tell me I'm dramatic, she sighed. We're coven sisters. Nothing can get between us. If it does, the punishment is death. You ought to know that by now. I'm not your first assignment. That much is true, I admitted. How long have you been at this again, she asked. You know. I've told you how long. She was exhausting. Right. You turned back in, centuries ago. Isn't that it? 
I nodded. And you've been night warden to five high sorceresses, including me. Six, including you, I amended. The third didn't live very long, though that was through no fault of mine. Witches weren't known for living long lives back then, especially in New England. One night warden against fifty men and women carrying lit torches and pitchforks isn't my idea of fair odds. Will you be honest with me about something? I wished she would shut up. If it suits me, I growled. Were any of them more powerful than me? Come on. Seriously? What difference does it make if the answer is yes? They're dead now. If I had a beating heart, it would have clenched involuntarily at her words. Yes. They were all dead. No, none were more powerful. And you already knew the answer before you asked the question. So why is it so hard for everyone to admit that I'm right? She asked. It was a rhetorical question. I could feel it, so I didn't bother answering. At any rate, there was no answer. And I was too busy remembering the warmth of blood on my hands, soaking into my clothes, as Charlotte took her final breath. I didn't say a word to her as we rode up to her penthouse. Not that we ever were much for conversation. Even if I hadn't already learned my lesson and decided to never get too close to another charge, I wouldn't have anything to say to her. Her mother and sister were right. She had caused undue chaos with her dramatic announcement. Maria had a point when she told Vanessa that her logic was sound, but not her approach. I wondered if she would ever learn to listen to her sister, or to anyone a little older and wiser. She pretended not to care, leaning against the elevator wall with her arms wrapped around her body. She was too young. I almost felt sorry for her when I considered how young she was, not young by human standards, though she looked no older than her twenties. Young by witch standards, especially by high sorceress standards. Most of them didn't come into power until they'd crossed the century mark, and her mother was nearly 150 when she took control of the coven. Vanessa was like a teenager compared to the others. A petulant, headstrong one who had never been denied a single thing in her life. She was coven royalty from the moment she drew breath, and her status had only grown the older she got. When her powers had started to manifest, I had felt that power the moment her blood touched my lips and brought me out of my long sleep. Her entire history had hit me at once, like a wave of information carried in that single first drop of thick, sweet red liquid. The more I drank, the more of her I understood. And the tighter we were bonded. Are you hungry? she asked as we entered the penthouse. She immediately bent to unzip her boots, then tossed them aside. The pleasure on her face as she walked in her stockinged feet made me wonder why women wore those things in the first place. Yes, I admitted, feeling vulnerable as I always did. I hated needing her, her blood, so much. I hated needing anyone, but especially her. She had the upper hand, no matter how much wiser or stronger or more jaded I was. I couldn't survive without her. She knew it. She led the way. Only we weren't going to her room or any of the others she typically left open to company. Instead, we crossed the kitchen floor, and she pressed her hand to the wall beside the refrigerator. A door sprang open, leading to what used to be the butler's pantry when the building was first erected. It was long, narrow, with only a cot and a few hooks for clothing along the walls. The walls were primer gray, like whoever had painted the apartment before Vanessa moved in had forgotten to finish the job. The color suited me. She sat on the cot as always, and I took my position at her feet as I withdrew the silver blade from its holster. No animalistic biting into her flesh for Vanessa. She wouldn't have it. A few murmured words over her outstretched wrist, then Vanessa drew the blade over her pale skin. Like magic, a thick line of ruby-red blood appeared. My thirst overcame me all at once, and I latched onto that wrist to draw out as much of the sweet salty liquid as I could. I swallowed greedily, overcome with bloodlust and hating myself for it all the time. How I needed her. How I couldn't survive without her blood, just hers. No one else's. 
That was the magic of the witches, making their night warden need them, and only them. A trickle of the precious liquid rolled down my chin, but I didn't stop to catch it. I couldn't stop. And as I drank, I experienced everything she felt. I couldn't see her thoughts, I could never see those, but the impressions of her emotions came at me all at once. Fear, jealousy, loneliness and anxiety swirled around in my head, and I wanted it to stop. I couldn't take much more of it, but I wouldn't stop drinking for anything because it tasted so good. I groaned, swallowing more, sucking harder. Enough. Her voice was firm and demanding. Even the barely slaked bloodlust wasn't strong enough for me to disobey her power. I released her, my tongue darting over her skin before she pulled her wrist away so I could get just a little more. It would never be enough. I was breathing heavy as I licked my lips. She was paler than before, and there were circles under her eyes. Just like always. She stood, a little shaky, and left my room without a word. The door closed silently behind her. I was alone. My breathing returned to normal after a few minutes, and I could stand without my head spinning from the blood intoxication. The moments after feeding, especially after a deep feeding, always left me a little dizzy. I pulled the cord attached to the light bulb hanging from the ceiling and got undressed, hanging my clothes on their hooks when I finished. It was time to wait until she needed me again. That was always the part one disliked most never knowing when something would come up. I had a general idea of her schedule, and new coven meetings came once a month, but the rest was always a crapshoot. I had to be with her, even when she took a trip to one of the million and one coffee shops within a two-block radius. What was it with 21st century humans and their coffee shops? It had taken a while for me to get used to that, after she woke me in my cell in the bowels of the fold. It took a while to get used to everything. A century spent underground would do that. I reflected on those early days as I cleaned her blood off my dagger, then polished it until it gleamed. Waking up in 2013, 100 years after I went into stasis, was nothing I could have imagined. Of course there were differences between all of my night warden assignments, especially between going to sleep in the early 1800s and waking up at the dawn of the 20th century. But the last time had provided the biggest shock of all. I had missed two world wars, the atomic age, the dawn of radio and television, the birth of the internet. All of it in 100 years, while I waited to be awakened again. While I waited for the last of Charlotte's imprint to wash out of my system. New York was a different world, too. I had always lived in the heart of it, since back before it was a proper city. It was a beautiful place in the old days, when Charlotte and I would walk the streets together at night. Sometimes we would be out until dawn doing nothing but talking. Passing gas-lit restaurants and hearing the soft clip-clop of hooves on cobblestone as carriages rolled past. A gentler time. Not like the one I was in with Vanessa. I looked at my reflection in the shining blade. I was the same as I had been when I was first turned, or virtually the same. Some of the youthful exuberance was gone from my face, some of the light gone from my eyes. But my hair was the same thick, deep brown, and my eyes were the same clear, icy blue. I stared into those eyes and almost wished it were all over. There was only so much I could take of being little more than a glorified slave. I returned the dagger to its holster and crawled into bed with one of the books I'd gotten into the habit of storing beneath the mattress. It would be a long night of torment and self-reproach unless I found a way to distract myself. Chapter 4 Elias It wasn't until the next morning that I left my room, cell really, but what of it? The door swung open on its silent hinges, and I stepped into the kitchen and walked down the hall to the little bathroom she had assigned as mine when I first moved in. Another marvel of the modern age. A quick shower before I dressed. It was only then that I noticed how quiet the penthouse was. I passed by the windows in the main room. The sun was halfway up in the sky, that happened sometimes when I sank too deep into whatever I was reading. 
I had finished a massive history of World War II, focusing on the European theater. I was a bit obsessed with it, seeing as how I could still remember the early days of my life in what had since become Serbia. I wanted to know everything that had gone on across the continent while I was in my state of slumber. I concentrated and listened carefully the closer I came to Vanessa's room. No sound. Not even breathing. I knocked. Vanessa. Are you all right? She was never an early riser, but I would normally hear her stumbling around the kitchen by nine or ten in the morning, fixing coffee and something to eat. It was unlike her to lie in bed for so long. She must have had a long night. I hoped she'd done a lot of thinking. I decided to take my life into my hands and tested the handle on the door. It turned easily and opened with no problem. And her bed was empty. Vanessa. I kicked aside the piles of clothing all over the floor and looked in the bathroom. Nothing. I went back to the bed and placed my hand on the pillow. Cold. She hadn't been there in a long time. Vanessa. I ran through the penthouse calling her name. She knew better. She should have known better, at least. Where would she go without me? The choices were endless in a city like New York. I couldn't even feel her. She was too far away. How could it have happened? How would I bring her back? Think, think. I took a few deep breaths and regained control of myself. It was the 21st century. Communication was much easier than it used to be. I still carried the cell phone she had purchased for me after that first imprinting and had laughingly shown me how to use. I had never actually used it since then, however, since we were always together. Damn it, I had told her time and again that our rooms were too far apart for me to hear if something went wrong, but she had insisted on privacy. Her number was programmed into the phone, and I pressed on her name on the phone screen as I paced back and forth in her bedroom. I had ended up in her bedroom after searching the entire penthouse, hoping to find a clue as to where she'd gone. It had only been five minutes since my discovery, but she could have been gone for as long as nine or ten hours by then. Hey, this is Vanessa. I squeezed my eyes shut when I heard her recorded voice and left a message ordering her to call me immediately. I then called the only other person listed in the phone. She picked up on the second ring. Elias? Maria couldn't have sounded more surprised. I looked over at the doors leading out to the balcony. Vanessa stood out there sometimes and always demanded that I leave her alone when she did. All I asked was that she let me know when she planned to get some air. The door was slightly ajar, but the balcony was empty. I craned my neck and looked down, down to the street below. At least it was empty. There wasn't a body splashed across the concrete. Elias! Maria shouted. I had already forgotten she was on the phone, in my ear. Immediately, I knew it would be a bad idea to tell her about the balcony doors. A very bad feeling swept over me. I don't mean to alarm you, but I think we have a problem. Chapter 5 Elias I remained silent while a storm raged around me. A storm called Cressida, Vanessa and Maria's mother. How could you let this happen? Cressida stormed around the penthouse, practically turning the place upside down. As if that would magically reveal her daughter's whereabouts. Maria stood by the window, chewing one fingernail as she looked out over the park. He didn't let it happen, mother. Maria shot me a look of apology. Well, how else would you explain it? The older witch glared at me, hands on her hips. I wanted to lash out at the witch, tell her she'd done a shit job of raising her little brat. That things like this wouldn't happen if she had only given out a little discipline when it counted, when it might have done a little good. If the entire coven hadn't treated Vanessa like she was the second coming of Christ from the moment she was born, she wouldn't get it into her head to do stupid things. I had no choice but to remain silent. 
It was part of the role I played as Night Warden, taking the abuse of the witches we were forced to associate with. Even though I itched to get outside and start looking, I stood there and absorbed her words. Even though I imagined crossing the room in three long strides, picking her up by the back of her neck and tearing out her throat, so her blood coated me from head to toe, I stayed in one spot and made my hands into fists instead, but that didn't keep me from fantasizing about killing Cressida. I could almost feel the warm, sticky blood dripping down my face, my body, as the life drained out of her. One less self-important witch in the world. Mother please, Maria said, going to her. Sit down. I'll make you a cup of tea. I could see where Vanessa's entitled attitude came from, based on the way Maria coddled her mother. I don't understand. How could you let her get away from you? Her shoulders slumped as the fight drained from her. How? I don't know, I admitted. It was the first time I had spoken since they arrived, and Cressida began tearing the place apart in search of a clue. I was in my room all night, reading. Normally, I'll hear her. Or feel her presence nearby. Nothing caught my attention. And now? Do you feel her presence? I shook my head. I don't. I know you wish it were otherwise. So do I. She's not the first charge you've lost, is she? Cressida held up one hand to silence me before continuing. You lost the first witch you were assigned after making the trip to the New World. She was oh so lucky I didn't want to die over her murder, or else the main room would become the scene of her brutal, bloody death. I could almost taste her blood on my lips, the vision was so clear. You know the villagers took her away and burned her mother. Maria slid past me with another apologetic smile. Those were different times. My charge didn't go against my orders then, with all due respect. I ground my teeth together and wished I could get away with saying more. All I needed right now was for someone in the fold to find out I had mouthed off to a former high sorceress. Good thing they couldn't find out what I was imagining. Maria spoke before her mother had a chance to. You think she ran away? I looked down at her, holding her mother's hand in both of her own. How could two people look so alike, yet be so different? Maria had Vanessa's black hair, gray eyes, full lips. But the eyes were softer, kinder. The lips curled up in a smile more often than they frowned. She was gentle where her sister was rough. But dealing with two such strong personalities for so many decades had turned Maria to steel inside. I couldn't know for sure, but I got a very strong feeling that there was more to her than met the eye. She was still in a sour mood when we returned, I explained. She felt as though no one understood her. She said that? Cressida asked. Not in words. I felt it. And I felt it again when I fed, before we parted ways for the night. She left me in my room, and I didn't see her after that. Maria blushed when I mentioned feeding. Maybe she thought it was something too intimate for me to talk about. I was in no mood to mince words with them. Cressida shook her head. I don't think she would have run. I know my child. Mother, you also know how headstrong she is. She was probably angry after last night, and she wants to make a point. We need her. We can't go on without her. She rolled her eyes. You know how she likes to drive a point home, in the most dramatic way possible. And she's not above putting herself in danger if it means proving she's right. I think Maria has the right idea here. I went to my room and took my trench of its hook, sliding my arms into the sleeves as I returned to the main room. It was torture, holding back the other factor in her disappearance. That open door. I still wasn't sure what it meant, but I intended to find out. Where are you going? Cressida asked. To look for her, of course. You stupid witch. I thought I would go out for one of those lattes the humans are so crazy about. Do you think that's wise? I mean, you haven't been out in the world on your own very much, have you? She looked at Maria, then back at me. What if something were to happen while my daughter walked in safe and sound? She wouldn't have a night warden to protect her. 
Good points, but they made no difference. I have to go. It's part of my duty. I'm going with you. Maria was already halfway into her coat. Are you sure? I asked, looking her up and down. She wouldn't be much help. I was the one who had imprinted on her sister, and that connection would be stronger than ever, thanks to having fed so recently. But Maria would know if we were dealing with creatures like herself, witches. I might be able to use that skill of hers. She glared at me. Positive. You're not the only one who knows the way my sister thinks. I'm beginning to believe nobody could ever really understand. We exchanged a brief look, and she blushed again. Mother, she said, turning away, wait for me back at the apartment. I'll call you if anything comes up. What happens if she gets back and there's nobody here? Cressida asked. I wasn't used to hearing her sound so helpless. She normally took control and never let anybody around her forget she had it. Losing her child wasn't something she knew how to navigate. Odds were she hadn't lost her forever. We would find Vanessa sulking somewhere, probably enjoying the thought of the rest of us panicking. Maria looked around, then shrugged. She'll probably think somebody broke in here while she was gone, from the way you've stormed through. But hey, she deserves to sweat a little, doesn't she? I barely had time to stifle a chuckle before she walked past me and out the door. I found myself following her, though it was my idea to look for Vanessa all along. I need to know I can trust you, I said as we rode down in the elevator. Trust me? Why wouldn't you be able to trust me? I opened my trench and revealed the smaller daggers, the hunting knife, the zip ties which might come in handy during questioning. Much stronger and easier to transport than a length of rope. The large freshly polished silver dagger, my pride and joy, sat in its holster on my hip. Her eyes widened. I need to know that if I'm forced to use any of these, you won't back down or run away. She chewed on her bottom lip for a moment. I tried to ignore the way that made me feel deep inside and down south. I didn't have those feelings. I was supposed to be like a machine, impervious to emotions and lust. Finally she spoke. Why, you think it'll come to that? I thought. I don't believe she ran away, Maria, I growled, closing my coat, fighting away the things she stirred within me. You don't? Why didn't you say anything up there? I couldn't help but sneer, and understanding touched her face. Right. My mother. I nodded. She wouldn't have taken it very well. No, she wouldn't have. Her eyes went wide. So, what do you think really happened? Her balcony door was slightly ajar. Either she went out last night, or somebody came in. The lock wasn't forced, so I'm thinking it was the former. Oh no. She reeled, then fell back against the wall. I need to know you're going to stay strong, I barked, making her jump. I will. I promise. She had gone a little pale for a moment, but she regained control of herself. Good. Because you know a lot more than I do about the creatures we might be dealing with. Creatures. We stepped out into the lobby, and she hurried to keep up with my long stride. Witches. Sorcerers, maybe, who knows? It's been a century since the last time we had trouble with sorcerers. Not even during my lifetime. I know. Which is why I have to think of them first. They've been lying in wait. We stepped outside together. The sky had clouded over since the morning, and a cold rain had started to fall. Not heavy, but enough to make Maria shiver and close her coat tighter around her neck. I wondered why she didn't just cast a spell to keep herself warm or something, but it was a very vague thought. Because something much more imperative was gripping me. The need for human blood, which hit me like a tidal wave as a sea of humanity flowed past in all directions. Chapter 6 Maria Just like that, Elias went rigid. Like a statue. One moment he was talking in that low rumble of his, almost snarling, and the next he went still. 
I touched his arm and he recoiled like something burned him, or he had felt something nasty. His eyes met mine, and I barely held back a gasp of surprise. They weren't that beautiful, icy blue anymore. They were blood red. And they smoldered like they might burst into flame at any moment. What's happening? I whispered, cowering away from him. I had never been so terrified in my life. His lips pulled back from his teeth in a snarl. My eyes darted around, half looking for help, and half praying that no one noticed, as we stood together under the overhang attached to the front of Vanessa's building. I. I can't. He swallowed hard. I can't stand it. His face twisted turned ugly. His eyes bulged, his skin went whiter than white. His jaw worked like his fangs were extending, and he didn't have room for them when his mouth was closed. What? What can't you stand? I whispered. Blood. I need blood. Now. He seemed to tower over me as his senses slipped away. I was losing him. It was so easy for me to forget who he really was. What he was. Not even human. Just a vampire. It was so easy to forget. You need to deal with it, I spat, staring up at him with all the intensity I could manage even though I was pretty close to peeing my pants. Or screaming. Don't tell me, he snarled. I know she cast the spell on you because I was there when you woke up. You should be able to control yourself in the presence of humans. You need to try. Why had he lost the control he'd had all this time? What changed? It's too much. His chest rose and fell with each desperate, rasping gasp for air. His body almost vibrated with need. I had never seen anybody lose it like that, and had no idea what to do. He grabbed my arm and squeezed until I yelped. I didn't fight him, as he dragged me around to the side of the building, and into a dark, dank, sour-smelling alley where rainwater ran down the brick walls. He slammed me into one of them so hard, it knocked the wind out of me. Stop this, I said, shoving him as hard as I could once we were away from prying eyes. It was no use, he was too strong. As unyielding as the bricks against my back. Your blood. I can smell it, it's like hers. He pressed me to the wall and leaned in close, his hot breath rasping in my ear as he ran his lips over my throat. My eyes closed before I could help myself. Being so close to him, like I had imagined so many times. My eyes snapped open again, and I did the only thing I could think to do. I brought my knee up as hard as I could and winced as he howled in my ear. He fell back against the wall opposite me and writhed in pain gripping himself. Now. You listen to me. I took the chance of charging at him, holding my hands up in front of me. You know who I am, and you know what I can do. I might not be my sister, but I'll knock your damned head off if you ever pull some shit like that with me again, vampire. Understood? I didn't want to use magic on him, but he'd really pushed me. His eyes were squeezed tight as he grimaced in agony, but he managed to nod his head. I understand you can't help the way you are, but you need to fight it right now because we have to find my sister. Got it? I didn't lower my hands, just in case he felt like springing on me again. I felt the power tingling in my fingertips, just ready for me to unleash on him. I didn't want to have to use it, not on him, but I knew I would if he pushed me any further. His eyes opened slowly. I could almost taste my relief when I saw that they'd gone back to their normal color, not that horrible blood red. You're going to behave now? I asked. Yes. I will. I apologize for losing my self-control. He stood slowly, grimacing in pain as he did. You were right, of course. Vanessa performed the spell to keep my bloodlust at bay. I've never reacted that way before, ever. It's never hit me so hard. All those people. He sounded almost wistful as he turned his head and looked down to the end of the alley, where oblivious humans walked past. They had no idea how close they had come to being his lunch. It hit me. Because she's not with you, I said, finally letting my hands drop to my sides. I never thought about it. The spell works, 
but it's not as efficient when you're not together. You've never felt that way because you've never been without her since you imprinted on her. And I guess there weren't this many people everywhere the last time you were here with your last charge. You're right. It's the only explanation that makes any sense. His forehead creased when he frowned, and his thick dark eyebrows knitted together. I don't know if I can control it. You don't have a choice, I reminded him. I wish I could cast a spell for you. But we both know how that would go. That's true. Both my coven, not to mention the High Council, and his fold would be pretty righteously pissed off if we messed around like that. Once a vampire imprinted on one of us, it was only that witch's blood they would drink. Only their spells they could live under. I had an idea. What about animals? There's bound to be a stray dog or cat around here. He shook his head. Animal blood is disgusting. Says the vampire who thinks human blood is a delicacy. Beggars can't be choosers, I said, instead saying of what I was thinking. He sneered. I'll be all right. I'm aware of it now, and I'm controlling it. The whole thing simply came as a shock. I can still smell the blood, but I don't need it. That's a relief then. I was so relieved, I could have cried. I looked up and noticed that it was still raining. And I was getting soaked. You think you can walk? I asked, looking him up and down. I'll try, he sneered. I regretted trying to be polite. Good. Let's get moving. Where do you want to check first, he asked. You'll see. It was going to my head, the fact that he had to follow my lead. I knew it, and I didn't care. In fact, I felt a little proud. For once, somebody had to listen to me. Chapter 7 Maria I brushed the rain from my coat once we stepped into the club and wished I had an umbrella. My hair was a soaked, tangled mess. I shook what water I could from it and fished around in my purse for a clip to hold it back. A messy bun was better than letting it hang in my eyes. Why are we here? he asked. There was a look of disgust on his face. Don't bother looking like you just stepped in dog shit, I muttered through clenched teeth as I scanned the room and saw nothing but hostile eyes looking back at me. Nobody here likes you any more than you like them. Thank you for the update, he growled back. Listen up. This happens to be one of the social hubs of our world, mine, I mean. You can't tell me my sister never told you about this place. She might have mentioned it once or twice, but it isn't like we spend long nights chatting by the fire. This was part of her old life. Right. She used to come in here all the time. Before she took over the coven, I mean. Now she can't come and go as she used to. That I've heard about, he chuckled humorlessly. I'm sure you have. Come on and behave yourself for her sake. I led the way through the nearly empty club. It looked as though only the employees were there, getting ready for that night's crowd. With the lights on and no music blasting from the speakers, it was like a completely different place. I had spent my fair share of time here. I wasn't under the same restrictions my sister was. I recognized Julius behind the bar, restocking the bottles and polishing the glasses. Julius. Long time no see. I was just thinking the same thing about you. The tall, burly bartender shot Elias a dirty look. Him I could do without seeing at all. Yeah, well, I'm sure he feels the same way. I could feel the disgust coming off Elias in waves, like he would rather do just about anything else than be in the presence of so many witches. Coven meetings must have been a real joy for him. I know you have to have a good reason for bringing him in here. Julius leaned on the bar, arms spread wide. Maybe to show my vampire companion what a long reach he had in case fists started to fly. So. What's up? I know you're the eyes and ears of this place, I said with a wide smile. You know all the dirt on everybody who steps foot in or out. Could be, he grinned. The overhead light shone down on his smooth head with its variety of tattoos. He'd updated his ink since we were together, I noticed. Have you heard anything about my sister? 
I asked, reminding my hormones to give it a rest already. He snorted. Hard. Her. This shit don't stink. Ah, so you have, I laughed, even as tension nodded in my stomach. Yeah, she's sort of a big deal now. Too big a deal to stop by anymore, he said, shaking his head with a frown. A real shame. She lit this place up. Yeah, it's a shame she found something more important to do with her life, Elias snarled. I threw an arm across his chest but didn't look at him. Anyway. Anything, you know, not so nice? Not even specifically to do with her. You can tell me, I winked. Come on. For old time's sake. Elias snorted in the back of his throat, but I ignored that. Julius's expression softened, as he remembered the handful of nights we'd spent together. My crazy misinformed youth. His eyes moved back and forth before he leaned in and dropped his voice to a whisper. You did not hear this from me. Do you understand? I mean, you weren't even here. He glanced at Elias. I really wish you didn't bring him in here with you. They'll remember him, anybody who gets asked any questions later on. Shit. I never thought of that. We'll have to take our chances. What is it? He looked around again before saying, a couple of strange dark warlocks have been showing their faces around here. The last three or four nights. They sit at the bar for hours, drinking their faces off. At first they're cool. You know. They don't say much, they keep to themselves. After an hour or two, shit starts spilling out of their mouths faster than I can pour the drinks. Now, you know the crowd we usually get in here. They just want to have fun. These douchebags have already scared a bunch of our customers away. What do they talk about? I asked breathless. Something about a ritual. Something that hasn't been done in years. A chosen one, sacred blood. Something that would let a sorcerer take over the powers of another witch or warlock. How much they were looking forward to the ritual taking place, and how important they'll be when their boss takes over one of the covens after this ritual. Did they say when that would be? Elias asked. His voice was flat, emotionless. They didn't. He straightened up and went back to his work. As I said, you never heard it from me. Now I think you'd better go. Fast. He wasn't kidding. We were attracting more attention than I was comfortable with. I felt curious eyes on us as we stepped back from the bar, then left the club hand in hand. I didn't know when I took Elias's hand, but I was holding it when we stepped back out into the nasty, chilly gloom. What did you make of that? I asked, as I turned up my coat collar against what had become a heavy mist. My palm still seemed to tingle from the touch of his skin. Have you ever heard of that ritual before? He looked up and down the street. His jaw worked, the muscles jumped. Clearly, he was still struggling to keep his bloodlust under control. No, but I'm sure there has to be a record of it somewhere. I could ask Mother. Don't do that. It'll only get her all worked up, and she'll want to mount a war when we're not even sure who the enemy is. Although I have my suspicions. Where should we go now? The mansion. The library at the mansion. If there's a clue to find, it'll be there. Chapter 8 Elias Maria and I were leafing through books at the mansion's library. Maria's hair a sexy knotted mess she'd pulled back. I never thought I would say this, but I wish I knew more about black magic. Maria shook her head as she flipped through page after page so fast, I thought she might tear them. Nothing in the book on rituals? I asked. No. Nothing that fits in with what Julius told us. A chosen one, sacred blood, taking another witch's power. I feel like we're running out of time, and I don't know what to do about it. A note of panic crept into her voice. Remember when I asked if I could trust you? I called out from the corner of the library, as I pulled down another book on ancient blood magic. There was a K on the end. Magic. It looked around as old as I was, if not older. Yes, yes. 
I remember. I need to know you're going to keep your head on straight. I picked up the book she had just finished skimming through and handed her the new one. Start on this. I feel like my eyes are crossing. What time is it? She rubbed the bridge of her nose between her thumb and forefinger. Not late enough for us to quit. I spread out a weathered old scroll and tried to make heads or tails of it, barely paying attention to her question. Nice. Very nice. Like I would quit on my sister. I didn't mean you would. You're the one who used that word, she snapped. She's not just my sister. She's my high sorceress. This is a bigger deal than you realize, Elias. I'm fairly sure I'm aware of the severity of the situation, Maria. But thank you for underestimating me. I glanced up at her. Don't make that mistake again. She rolled her eyes. Right. When you know as well as I that I could drop you like a bad habit with a flick of my wrist. Don't test me and stop wasting time. She dove headfirst into the book, squinting as she read. I had to give her credit, she gave as good as she got. Here's a question I think we need to keep in mind, I said as I rolled up the useless scroll. Who would have the power to either scale the walls of the apartment building or transport themselves to the balcony? Because they couldn't walk in with the intent to harm her. There are dozens of spells surrounding the building to protect her from that. She looked up. That's a good question. Maybe we've been approaching this the wrong way. Who has the power? And why would they want hers if they already have so much of their own? I snorted. When you have power, you want more power. There's never enough. You speak as though you know. Maybe I do, I murmured. She sighed, looking around the room. When I think that I stood right here last night in front of this podium and said such nasty things to her. She deserved it. Maria's eyes widened in surprise. I didn't think you were allowed to speak against her. Who told you that? I asked with a raised brow. Her mouth fell open, then she blushed. My mother, she blurted out before dissolving into a fit of laughter. She always told us her night warden wasn't allowed to talk back. Maybe she just wanted him to keep his mouth shut, now that I think about it, she always shot him one of those looks when she said it. She imitated her mother's cold glare, the imperious way she looked down her nose. I had to admit, she had it down to a science. I even smiled for the first time in, well for the first time in a long time. But her laughter was a little too loud, a little too shrill. It ended in a strangled sob as she leaned her head on her palms and burst into tears. I turned away, looking out the window, not that there was much to look at even without the rain which had picked back up. The neighborhood was bad enough without adding water. She wouldn't stop crying. I grimaced as I looked back at her. She was helpless, heartbroken. All the abuse she had ever taken from her more gifted sister, hadn't done anything to make Maria love her any less. It was probably that love which kept her going without cracking under the strain. Don't cry, I said, going to her. We'll get her back. If my last words to her were nasty ones. I took her by the shoulders and eased her up until she stood straight, then flinched when she fell against me. My arms hung at my sides, and I wished like hell that I hadn't touched her. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just hate myself so much right now. I was so mean. You? Mean. No. I reached up and awkwardly patted her shoulder. If anything, you've taken too much of her bullshit for too many years. Unless this attitude of hers just started when she came into power. No, no, she's always been a real pain in the ass, she admitted, half laughing, half crying. I thought so but you've never been anything but good. Sometimes I wonder if she deserves a sister as good as you. She froze, then stood and looked up at me. Really? She sniffled, eyes wide. Oh, great. She would think I liked her because of that. Well, yeah. You never threw any spells at her, or whatever it is you do. I patted her shoulder one more time before going back to the long, heavy desk I had been working at before she broke down. 
it was better to pretend that had never happened. Just like she was nice enough not to mention my losing control when we first left the apartment building. I remembered the sheer unbridled lust which had raced through me and set my brain on fire with need. My mouth went dry when I recalled the scents moving all around me. Sweet hot blood, pumping through the veins of so many clueless humans. Just waiting for me to sink my fangs in and drink deep, sating my thirst no matter how many lives it took. And Maria. I had smelled her blood too, and the scent reminded me of Vanessa. No matter what I thought of Vanessa, her blood kept me alive. For a split second, I had tried to convince myself that drinking from her sister was the next best thing, that nobody would care and I would get away with it. That was how insane the bloodlust made me. I wanted to rationalize all manner of stupidity. And her body. She had been so warm and fresh. Another good reason for me not to return her hug. I didn't need the reminder of how ripe she was. Soft and full. Hello, Maria said. What? I had no idea how long she had been talking while my thoughts were a mile away. What would she think if she knew I had been thinking about the firmness of her breasts against my chest, and the way her short breathless gasps had gotten me hard? I asked if you think Christoph or one of his friends would be capable of something like this. He's the only sorcerer I've ever heard stories about, and they were all terrible ones. Just like that, I snapped back to reality. I'm sure they were all true too. So you knew him? Of him, yes. I witnessed the results of a few of his schemes a long time ago. What was he like? What did he do? He enslaved witches, I said without hesitation. It was always his goal to increase his power. Our eyes met, and I knew the horror in hers was reflected in mine. You think, she asked. I do. We've approached this from the wrong direction. We have to find him or someone who knows him. We have to get to the heart of what he's plotting. We raced out of the mansion and down the broken brick stairs. Maria was right about one thing. It was strange, thinking about how different everything was less than a day earlier. Christoph. A name I had hoped I'd never hear again. Maria didn't need to know the specifics of what he could do when he set his mind to it, but I couldn't hold back the flood of memories. The way an entire coven had almost disappeared from the world because of his plotting. Picking them off one by one, sapping their powers before killing them and tossing their bodies aside like garbage. The police had called it a rash of murders, perhaps a serial killing. That wasn't a common term back in the early days of the 1900s, but Christoph had made it a household one. Women were terrified to walk the streets back then, no matter the time of day or night. They didn't know that the murders were all very specific, poor things. That the only requirement for one's body to be found washed up on the pilings along the river, half eaten by fish or face up in the middle of Central Park with its skin peeled off, was to be in possession of magical powers. My fingers lengthened into claws when I remembered those days, and all the witches he had mutilated. I should have killed him when I had the chance. Chapter 9 Maria I could feel their presence, my mother and the other witches, before we reached the top floor of the building. So could Elias. Witches. The word seemed to drop out of his mouth with a thud. You don't care very much for us, do you? It hurt more than a little to know what he thought of us. Of me. Just because of who we were. I thought the feeling was mutual. He looked at me without turning his head, his eyes like slits in his handsome face. Not everything is black and white, I murmured, turning my face away. Why would Cressida bring them here? Oh, the disdain in his voice and the way it set my nerves on edge. I've had just about enough of this, I snapped, turning to him. It took a lot to push me too far, but he had gone there. Or maybe it was the sting of knowing how he saw me. First things first. She's my mother and the former high sorceress. You need to speak of her with a little more respect. Excuse me? I ignored that, along with the expression of mixed anger and amusement on his face. 
Second, you're doing this in service of my sister, who leads our coven. When you protect her, you protect them. So I'd like to hear a little respect in your voice when you refer to them, thank you very much. And if I refuse, he asked with disdain. Then, I show you that my sister isn't the only one who knows how to cast a spell. Not that I would. Not that I was even sure I could against him. But there was no way of knowing for sure, so a threat was as good as I could do. I didn't let my doubts change the way I looked him straight in the eye, though. He tilted his head to the side, like he was sizing me up. Understood, he muttered. Simple as that. I almost sagged against the wall of the elevator car in relief. The doors opened in time to save me from that humiliation. The fact was, I was just as irritated as he was when I felt the presence of my coven sisters. I couldn't put my finger on why. They deserved to know that Vanessa's disappearance might be much more sinister than we first thought, of course. It might affect them somehow, too. It was the lack of time that bothered me. I couldn't wait around and listen as my mother tried to take control of the situation. Will we tell them what we think? I asked as we approached the front door. I'm not sure, he admitted. Let's see what we find in there. What we found was nearly two dozen witches standing in a circle, chanting. I recognized it immediately, a protection spell for Vanessa calling on wards to wrap her in protection against any threat which might befall her. It couldn't hurt. I wondered what they'd do if they knew just how much danger she might be in. Our arrival was an interruption, and my mother caught my eye from across the room. She was at the head of the circle, of course, with her back to the window. She raised her arms in greeting. You're just in time, your presence is sure to strengthen our spell, she said in a low melodic voice. Candles flickered in the draft caused by our opening the door. Elias slammed it shut. I silently cursed him for being such an idiot. A few of the candles sputtered, and several heads turned in our direction. We had ruined the moment. We're sorry, I said, blushing furiously. I'm not, he whispered. I glared at him. Join us, Diana encouraged, standing at my mother's right hand. I told myself it wasn't right to feel a little flash of irritation toward her. She was my coven sister. We were all part of something bigger than ourselves. That didn't stop me from thinking she was a little too much at times. They all know, my mother stated matter-of-factly. Yes, so I gathered. I looked at Elias, who went off to the kitchen to fetch some of the synthetic blood Vanessa kept on hand. If he wasn't thirsty, the need for blood wouldn't be so strong. At least I hoped so. I turned back to my mother. I thought you were going to my apartment. I thought it would be best to perform the spell here, where she lives, my mother explained, lowering the hood of her robe. The only light in the room came from the candles lit throughout, and her hair and eyes glistened in the flickering glow. I wish I could join you. I truly do. But Elias and I only stopped in for a minute. Did you find anything? I shook my head. Nothing concrete. But it's been hours. The sun has set, and there still isn't any sign of her. Another head shake. No. It's looking more and more like this isn't a case of running away, or even wandering off. I guess it's better that we all know the truth. There's more to it than that. Elias strode in. I could smell the blood on his breath. I was glad he hadn't drank in front of me. I had already seen how he changed when it came to getting his blood, and it wasn't something I wanted to see again. More. My mother asked, one eyebrow cocked. A murmur rose over the room. I wondered how easily the rest of my coven would accept the word of a vampire. Nightwarden or not, his kind wasn't exactly trusted. My stomach clenched and my palms went sweaty. I think we should all find seats. There isn't much time, but you might be able to help us. I was looking at my mother when I said it. What is this all about? But she sat. So did the others, after they blew out their candles. Elias switched on the lights. 
Without the mystical glow of the candles, my sisters looked less magical and much more vulnerable as they stared at me with their wide, apprehensive eyes. How should I tell her? There was no way to do it that wouldn't alarm her too much. I looked over their heads and into Elias's eyes. He nodded ever so slightly, encouraging me. That was enough to get me started. Mother, have you ever heard of a blood magic spell which allows the witch who performs it to absorb the powers of the witch they choose to perform the spell upon? Her mouth fell open. A terrible silence spread over the room at her reaction. She didn't speak for a long time, when she did it was to Elias. You think it's happening again? she asked with a tremor in her voice. It's a strong possibility, he replied. I don't understand. What does this all mean? I asked, looking back and forth between the two of them. I never would have expected them to have a common ground, something only the two of them seemed to be aware of. She clasped her shaking hands together and looked at the floor. It's happened before, a sorcerer kidnapping witches and draining their power. Over a hundred years ago, well before your time or anyone else's here. Only Elias and I were around then. I can't believe it. I thought. I don't know. I thought he was gone, dead. Who? Kristoff? I asked. Gasps filled my ears. His name was a curse to us, a word we never used. She nodded slowly, like someone who was trying to recover from a great shock. I was very young then, younger than Vanessa is now. My sister, Marissa, had only just been accepted to Cascade Circle Coven. She's now their high sorceress, but at the time it was Charlotte. Only her eyes moved, and they rested on Elias's face. I was her nightwarden, he muttered through clenched teeth. His entire body was like a coiled spring, he was so tense. I realized it gave him pain to think or talk about her, though I was sure he would rather die than admit it. Why? It was that coven which Kristoff chose to attack. He didn't go after Charlotte, but rather many of the coven's members. It was a very dark, terrible time. I'll never forget the terror we all experienced then. I wanted Marissa to leave the coven to join us, but she refused. We had a terrible fight over it, and never reconciled, even after Kristoff went into hiding. He was stealing power from witches? I prompted, trying to get my mother back on track. The more she said, the more panicked I felt. Yes. Always around the full moon. A witch would disappear, and no matter the efforts made to reclaim her, it was always pointless. Her body would be found within the month. In the river, in the park, along the shoreline. My mother shuddered as a single tear rolled down her cheek. Mutilated. Oh, so terribly mutilated. Eyes gouged, tongue removed. One of the girls was flayed, probably while she was still alive. The sound of soft sobbing filled the room. They weren't the only ones overcome. Tears filled my eyes and spilled over onto my cheeks. What if Vanessa became one of them? My mother looked at Elias. He's going after the high sorceress now, rather than bothering with the witches under her. He cleared his throat. We've heard rumors of a chosen one, someone with sacred blood. It does seem like he's stepped up his plans quite a bit. He's had long enough to plot for something like this. He was waiting for someone like Vanessa. Oh, I should have known. I should have seen it coming. My mother held her head in her hands and wailed. I warned her against living here. I warned her against making herself visible. I wanted her to live near me, where she would be safer. She never listened. Instantly, a half-dozen witches surrounded her and begged her to be calm, not to blame herself. That she couldn't have known. Not that I disagreed with them per se, but there wasn't any time for this. We could console each other after the fact, whatever the outcome was. You said it always took place around the full moon, this ritual? I asked, raising my voice to be heard. She nodded in the middle of all the pats on the back and gentle hugs. Yes. Within three days of the full moon. And the body was generally discovered by the new moon. We don't have much time. 
I looked to Elias. He nodded. I would imagine this is the time when a witch's powers are at their most vital. That's right. What did I know of rituals like that? Think think damn it. He would want some time to cleanse her first. Make sure her blood is pure enough to ensure the ritual's success. He might not have started yet. Yes, but he will soon enough. Elias turned to my mother. Did anyone ever find out where Kristoff hid in those days? Any of your kind, I mean? She shook her head. Most likely outside the city limits, but that was the best any of us could discover. Somewhere he wouldn't be noticed, certainly. All right. He looked at me. I nodded. It was time to get moving. Where are you going? My mother turned as I hurried across the room to the door. We have to start looking. We need to find where he is. I looked back at her and tried to smile. I promise we're going to find her. No matter what it takes. Her chin quivered. Please be careful. It wasn't me. I was worried about being careful. It was everyone we would come up against. Chapter 10 Elias I waded across the street from the club, with one hand clenched tight in the pocket of my coat and the other resting on the handle of my dagger. The bloodlust had lessened in my head, from a deafening roar to a subtle thumping like the beginnings of a headache. I used to get terrible headaches when I was human. The pain was one of the few things I remembered clearly. Looking back, knowing what I knew hundreds of years later, there might have been a serious problem with my eyes or even my brain. When I was turned, all of that disappeared, along with everything else that made me who I was back then. What was taking Maria so long? It was getting late, and judging by the number of people walking into the club, the place was bound to be packed. What were the odds that the two warlocks would return? As Maria had pointed out, it was better than nothing. If they didn't come in, perhaps someone who knew them would. That was our best chance at finding out where Kristoff did his filthy business. I pictured him in my mind. Tall, imperious, with snow-white hair despite his relatively young age. As though something had shocked him terribly and turned it white in an instant, without a hint of color left behind. Eyes as black as midnight. Evil eyes. Eyes belonging to a creature with no understanding of right and wrong. The only thing he responded to was that which would benefit him in some way, never caring what it meant to those he used. I remembered that witch who was flayed. Henrietta. A beautiful thing. She had no skin when they found her, her mouth still open in a silent scream. I had never experienced agony like that. I couldn't imagine it. And I didn't want to. I pulled up the collar of my coat against the mist, which wouldn't stop blowing around. It had been an ugly sort of day all around. At least I blended into the shadows well. The people hurrying back and forth down the sidewalks weren't in the mood to notice the things around them in their haste, but that was the normal way of life in the fast-paced century in which I'd found myself. I wondered if they knew what an ugly world they lived in whether they had a clue what went on behind some of the many windows facing out onto the street. How much filth and evil there really was, the sort of evil that didn't get newspaper coverage or time on the television. I had seen too much of it to pretend it would ever go away. It only took different forms as time marched on. The sight of Maria emerging from the club was something like the first rays of sun after a long storm. She was one of the only good, decent people I had met in my most recent assignment. I had to admit to myself that her sister outshone her. So did her mother. I hadn't paid much attention to her over the several years spent guarding her sister. As she jogged across the street glowing with energy, I wished I had. All right. Julius agrees to help us. What a prince, I snarled. Hey. We need all the help we can get right now. I don't need your shitty attitude getting in the way. She craned her neck, looking up and down the street. They don't normally come in for at least another hour, though. According to Julius, anyway. What do we do in the meantime? 
I had a few ideas about that. Come with me. I only live two blocks from here. We're going to your apartment. Yes. Hence my telling you that I live so close. She sighed. What? Is there some spell I'm not aware of that makes it impossible for you to step foot in any apartment other than Vanessa's? No, of course not, I spat. You're working out the steps in your mind, but not sharing the plan with me. Oh. Sorry. She blushed. I guess I need to calm down. I waved it off. Come on. What's the plan? Let's walk and talk. We left the alley I'd been hiding in and made a right, then another right at the first corner. As we walked, heads dipped low, hands in our pockets, she said, I figured I would go in and get a look at these two for myself but I don't exactly look club ready at the moment. I look like a drowned rat. You don't think you'll stand out? I think I would stand out more looking the way I do now, she snorted. I didn't mean it that way. You and Vanessa look so much alike. You don't think they'll notice you, recognize the relationship? We stopped at a red light, and she looked up at me, her mouth open. Of course. And if they do recognize me and make it obvious that they do, we'll know we're on the right track. You're a genius. I shook my head. Not exactly where I was going with that. She seemed to be ignoring my comment. Then we work well together, she suggested, then cleared her throat loudly and switched gears as we continued across the street. At any rate, I have to spruce up a little so I'll blend in with the others. You could probably use a few minutes out of this nasty weather. The weather doesn't affect me, I scowled pushing ahead. Don't you feel anything? Ever. Rarely. She shrugged and made a quick turn up the stairs of an unassuming brownstone building, one like so many others around it. You live here? I asked, looking at our surroundings. She was at the top of the stairs already, and turned to look at me. Where did you expect? A cave? No. I expected something. Nicer. Yes. I'm sure. She waved me up the stairs, and I followed, keeping my eyes open the whole way for any suspicious movement in the deep shadows. I couldn't understand how she moved so freely and casually when she knew what horrors life held. Especially when she'd heard her mother's stories. I followed her up three flights of stairs and into her apartment. Compared to her sister's, it was a closet. One small room with a few pieces of furniture. No television, I noted, which was another way in which she and her sister differed. Vanessa lived to watch TV. A small kitchen to the right of the front door with a bedroom beyond. Another bedroom to the left, and I assumed a bathroom just off that. Why do you live this way? I asked, turning in a slow circle as I took in the plants, the art on the walls, and the dozens of books. Maybe hundreds. They drew my eye, stretching from one end of the living room wall to the other. Live this way? You make it sound pretty dire, she grumbled as she marched to her room and closed the door. My sensitive ears could still pick up every move she made. The sound of her shoes hitting the floor. The heavy wet coat joining them. The zipper on her jeans as she lowered it. I only wonder when your mother and sister live so differently. I picked up one of the books at random. A biography of George Washington. Another of Abraham Lincoln. I had read about both of them. Granted, I remembered when Washington was still alive, though I had missed the Revolutionary War. Asleep far beneath the ground. More books. Art history fiction. A lot of fiction. Hemingway, Austin, Fitzgerald, Morrison. She had broad tastes. I enjoy your literary collection, I called out, flipping through the Washington biography. Oh. Thanks. You read? I need some way to fill my evenings. Right. I forgot. You don't sleep. Correct. I'm going to get in the shower, but it won't take long. Moments later, the sound of running water. I replaced the book and went to the windows. There were three in a row, all facing the street. 
Rain rolled down the panes and dripped from the leaves still on the trees. Mostly, the dead leaves collected in gutters stuck to the sidewalk. They stunk of death and rot, even from where I stood with the windows closed against the stench that only I and the few stray animals roaming the street could detect. From inside, surrounded by books and plants and flowers, it was almost difficult to imagine it being so bleak out there. I never had a problem imagining it in Vanessa's penthouse. One would assume the opposite would have been true, surrounded by luxury the way Vanessa was, looking out at the park and the tall, glistening buildings surrounding it. Most of the time, when I could see out the windows, I would imagine all the crime that was taking place down there. The muggings and beatings and rapes. In a city the size of New York, in a place with plenty of seclusion, if one knew where to look, it was natural. Humans couldn't help themselves. One of the many things Charlotte and I used to talk about on our walks. I wondered what she would think, if she could see the world as it was a century after her death. We thought it was bad back then, and it did have its negative points. But nothing compared to the present. No, she was too good for this time. It was better, for her to lie in a crypt I had never been able to visit. It's a shame you don't have dry clothes, Maria called out from behind her closed door. I won't catch cold, I reminded her. And I don't feel the weather. You don't feel anything, she asked. I was almost surprised that she sounded surprised. Weren't you ever acquainted with Cressida's night warden? I turned away from the window. She was rubbing a towel over her body, I could hear the terry cloth sliding over her skin. My mouth went dry, and I licked my lips at the thought of what was under the clothes she had worn in the alley. When I crushed her body to mine, I could just imagine her slim waist and full hips, a firm derriere to go with the breasts I had come so close to touching. Desire unfurled deep in my core, the sort of desire I hadn't experienced in forever. Not very well. It's not as if you're allowed to get very personal with your charges, is it? No, but there's no rule about the sister of my charge. I swallowed hard and tried to blot out the dark, seething lust bubbling up in me, blotting out all rational thought. Are you still out there? she asked. Yes. I am. And I'm going to kick that door down and throw you to the floor and take you until you lose consciousness. I dug my claws into my palms, until I hissed at the breaking of my skin. But it didn't do much to calm my hunger. It had been so long since I felt a warm writhing body beneath mine, and the tight, wet heat around my thrusting cock. For once, I needed to taste something other than blood. Like her skin, her lips. I turned back toward the window and willed myself to fight it off. There was far too much at stake for me to lose control at the worst possible moment. Vanessa must be terrified, wondering if I or anybody else would ever come for her. Who knew what Kristoff was doing? What he was taunting her with? Or whether he'd bothered to inform her what his plans were at all? Maybe he was saving it for a surprise. I forced myself to picture Henrietta and her skinless silent scream. It helped. And at just the right moment too, since Maria stepped out of her bedroom. I watched her in the reflection in the windows. The short black dress. The knee-high boots. She shrugged into a denim jacket which somehow was the perfect touch. She wore her long black hair in a knot on top of her head, and there was much more makeup on her face than I was used to seeing. It brought out her eyes, her high cheekbones, the creaminess of her skin. And when she slicked a shiny lipstick on her pouty lips, I almost groaned. She was nothing short of stunning. She turned her wide, innocent eyes on me and I could have sworn a jolt of electric current ran through me. You ready? she asked, standing by the door. For the first time in forever, I wasn't entirely sure that I was. Chapter 11 Elias She'd been in there for far too long. At least two hours. What was the problem? Hadn't they come in yet? Granted, I hadn't seen anybody who looked remotely threatening walk in or out, but then again, I didn't find many creatures to be a threat. What did a dark warlock look like? It wasn't as though I spent time with any. I suppose they could blend in. 
I imagined her in there and wondered about the effect she was having on the men. Were they looking at her the way I had? Envisioning the same things I had? Wondering what it would be like to... I shook my head. Get a hold of yourself. What was it that humans did to clear their minds when they couldn't stop thinking about sex? A cold shower? I chuckled darkly. I had been under a cold shower almost all day long, but it hadn't helped a bit. What else was there? It didn't matter. Not when I saw the club doors open and watched two men stumble out, laughing loud enough to wake the dead. They were flying high for sure and very full of themselves. I wondered if it could be them. There was a nasty, angry note to their laughter that carried across the street to my waiting ears. No wonder they left with only each other to keep them company. I pitied the woman desperate enough to spend time with them, and I didn't know the first thing about them. Until Maria left the club just behind them and locked eyes with me. I waited until they were roughly halfway down the block before crossing the street and falling into step behind her. Yes? I muttered, never taking my eyes from them. Yes? She practically ground her teeth together. Did you hear anything in there? Everything I needed to hear. There was real rage in her voice. She wanted to slaughter them as badly as I did. But we needed them. Once we had the information we were looking for, however, we didn't exchange another word as we trailed them. I listened hard to their conversation, but couldn't catch much to give an indication of where they were going. In an ideal situation, they would lead us straight to Kristoff. I had long since stopped being naive enough to think they would make things that easy. All I wanted was a little time alone with them. They sense us, Maria whispered. How do you know? I feel it. See the way their body language has changed. Sure enough, neither of them strutted and stumbled as they had when they first left the club. They walked like men struggling to shake off a drunken binge because they knew there was trouble heading for them. Like they were expecting us to pick their pockets. Can you put a spell on them? I asked as an idea dawned on me. Control them, I mean. And make them do what? Make them do what we want. So I can put them in a cab and take us someplace a little more intimate. Elias, she warned. What? You just sounded like you wanted to slice them open and rub salt in their wounds, I reminded her. This isn't the time for half measures. You're in or you're out. You know I'm in. Well? She made a small frightened sound like an animal who knows it's cornered and wishes it wasn't. Mind control is extremely taxing. I don't know how much help I can be once we have them where you want them. Don't worry, I snarled, watching the two warlocks as they did everything they could to look casual. I won't need your help after that. All right. Here goes. She stopped in her tracks and raised both arms until they were straight in front of her, palms up. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath, humming low in the back of her throat. I looked ahead of us, to the warlocks. They didn't react at first, and I wondered if she wasn't as good as she thought she was. Then they slowed down. Almost as though they'd forgotten where they were going. Or like they had forgotten everything. When they stopped, I knew they were under her control. She opened her eyes. Let's go. Her voice sounded different. Strained. Like she was doing too many things at once. Mind control was taxing and she was controlling two minds. Some instinct told me to take her arm and led her the rest of the way to where the warlocks waited. Let's get a cab, I suggested, raising my free arm. Up close, the two warlocks weren't any more impressive than they were from far away. Probably what made them so potentially dangerous. On the surface, they blended in. Nothing special about either of them. It was when they opened their mouths and let their vile beliefs spew out that it was easier to pick them out of a crowd. Not like Kristoff. Something about the look of him automatically inspired distrust. I opened the back door to the first cab that pulled up to the curb and assisted the two helpless creatures into the back seat. 
Maria sat beside them, while I sat in front with the driver. I didn't want her next to them, but I understood the reason. She'd control them better when she was closer to them. Where to? he asked, chewing hard on a toothpick. You know, I don't usually let people sit up front with me. Yes, well, I appreciate you making this exception. I gave him an address, he looked suspicious but shrugged good-naturedly as he pulled away. A look over my shoulder at Maria confirmed that she still had everything under control. I had never seen anyone look so focused. The driver noticed her and glanced at me. What are the three of you doing out with a girl like her? he asked, smiling wide. I could almost read what was on his disgusting mind. If I didn't need him to get us where we were going, I would have slit him open from groin to stern him just for considering thinking about her that way. She was so far above him, they might as well have come from different planets. We're just coming back from a night out, I explained, gritting my teeth as I turned away from him. The longer I looked at him, the clearer was the mental image of tearing his flesh to pieces. At least the nose-burning scent of his body odor made him less appetizing. And you're going to that part of town? What is dumpster divin part of your night out? He laughed. It's a scavenger hunt, one of the two warlocks said. His voice was flat, lifeless as Maria spoke through him. Oh, one of those, the driver said, nodding like he had any idea what he was talking about. Just be careful out there, you know? I mean, there's some shady characters wandering around the old warehouses at night. I almost laughed out loud. If he only knew who was in his cab, the very shady characters he was describing. We passed the rest of the ride in silence, and before long I noticed the way the architecture changed. Apartment houses with street-level shops and restaurants turned into tall boxy buildings with fewer and fewer intact windows. It grew darker, too, since almost none of the street lamps were in working order. Now and then a shadow would move, indicating the presence of junkies looking for a fix. You sure about this? The driver asked once more as we pulled up to one of the last warehouses before the docks, which jutted out onto the river. Very. I looked back to Maria, who handed over a wad of bills. I didn't know how much more she gave him than was necessary, she didn't have it in her to count the money, it seemed, but the man seemed overjoyed. Wow. Thanks, gorgeous. You sure you don't need me to hang around, wait for you guys? Looking for another tip, I guessed. No, thank you. I helped the warlocks out through the rear door, while Maria stepped out behind the driver. They swayed on their feet, but that could be chalked up to drunkenness should the driver notice. I took their arms, and led them through the open doorway of one of the buildings. I was familiar with the area from the old days and knew none of the old warehouses and factories on that particular stretch of land were still in use. One of the few kind gestures Vanessa had made was allowing me to explore those areas, albeit from behind the windows of a car. This way, I grunted as I led them inside. Touching them was enough to make my skin crawl, but I pushed down the disgust they inspired. They knew where Vanessa was. It took all my self-control to keep from yelling at them, demanding the truth of her whereabouts. A truth I wasn't sure they would give up easily. I was counting on it. I even looked forward to it. I tossed the two of them to the floor, and they fell like sacks of grain. No effort to resist. Maria stood beside me, barely breathing. I hurried then sensing how hard she was struggling to keep them under control. I helped out with two zip ties around the ankles, two around the wrists. Does this make it easier for you? I asked when I straightened up and looked down on them. Somewhat. She visibly relaxed, but not entirely. I have to keep them from casting spells to escape, or using any sort of psychic connection to contact Kristoff or others like them. And there were bound to be others. I looked back at them and saw them blinking hard, shaking their heads. One of them snarled. What is this? His eyes darted back and forth between Maria and me. What's your name? I asked. He opened his mouth in an ugly snarl, but whatever he intended to hurl at me didn't come out. His face showed surprise then frustration. 
Jeremiah, he said haltingly like some outside force was making him speak. Which it was, Maria. His friend struggled against the restraints. You think this can hold us, he spat. Right. I would start with him. A swift kick to his kidneys made him curl up in agony. I relished the sound of his groans as I rolled him onto his back and crouched over him, one knee on either side of his ribs. Open your eyes, I commanded, one hand on the blade of my dagger. He refused, as I knew he would. Anticipation mixed with adrenaline, but it was still important to keep myself focused. I withdrew the dagger, but only held it in my hand. It was sturdy, strangely warm. His eyes bulged for just a second at the sight of it before he turned his expression to stone, but it was long enough for me to notice. Let's try being polite, I whispered almost like a caress. What's your name? Fuck off, he spat. Without Maria in his head, he could pretend to be a tough guy. But that was all he was doing, pretending. That's fine. I don't need to know anything about you to do this. I drew the blade down the length of his face, from temple to jawline, and blood began to ooze. He hissed and tried to buck me off. I pressed my knees into his ribs to calm him down, then chuckled. If you think that was bad, you're in for a terrible time. I looked over at his friend, Jeremiah. Does this look like fun to you? He turned his head away. No. I barked, and it echoed through the empty space. You do not get to look away. Remember when you couldn't control yourself earlier? I'll make you watch. You won't have a choice. And if you try to close your eyes, I'll slice off your eyelids. Slowly, his head swiveled back in my direction. His friend, the one beneath me, whimpered softly. What do you want to know? he asked. Now we're getting somewhere. I turned my attention to him, waving the blade close to his face as I spoke. His blood was on it, the same blood which oozed down the side of his face and into his wavy brown hair. I gritted my teeth and commanded myself to ignore it. I want to know about the ritual you've been blabbing about in front of people at the club. Specifically when it's taking place, where and with whom. He gaped at me, then burst out laughing. I couldn't have been more surprised. You think I'm going to tell you? He sputtered between gasps for air. Oh, that is rich. I've always heard that vampires are stupid, pathetic creatures, but this. I never broke eye contact as I cut off his right ear with a light flick of my dagger. I watched with intense satisfaction as his eyes flew wide open before he howled in shock and pain. I pointedly avoided looking at the rich flow of blood over the side of his head while picking up the ear off the dirty floor and holding it up for him to see. The scent of his blood, pumping fast and full thanks to his racing heart made me a little high. It took effort to keep myself thinking clearly. The image of Vanessa's face did it. Any more opinions you'd like to share before telling me what I want to know? I asked, dangling the ear in front of his eyes. He screamed and bucked harder than ever, which gave me no choice but to dig my knees into his ribs in hard sharp jabs until he gasped for breath. The sound of his snapping bones filled me with almost unbearable pleasure. I'll cut your damned eyeballs out if you don't tell me what I want to know right now. Right this very moment. I glanced at Jeremiah who blubbered like a baby, then tossed the ear his way. He screamed and tried to dodge it, but it landed on his chest with a satisfying splat. I can't tell you, my nameless one-eared captive wailed. He'll kill me. I'll make you watch your heart beat its last before I cut out your eyes. My face was inches from his. The desire to gulp down his blood was almost overwhelming. I fought through it and held the point of the dagger against his chest. Come on. Give me an excuse. He's in an old hotel down in Atlantic City. Jeremiah wailed. Please stop this. Let us go. Who is? I asked, looking down at the other one. Kristoff, he whimpered. An old abandoned place. Would have been torn down, but there's a bunch of spells and protection wards on it. That's where he lives, that's where we all gather. That's where she is. She? Maria snapped. The sorceress. 
the one, the chosen one, his eyes filled with tears. Please no more. Please. We'll disappear. He doesn't need to know you found us. You're right. I slashed the silver blade through the air and just like that, blood poured out of the gaping wound in his throat. I jumped up to avoid getting caught in the flood, I didn't know if I would be able to avoid feeding from him if his blood touched my lips, and watched with grim satisfaction as he died. His feet skittered across the floor as he struggled to hold on to life, but it was pointless. One more shudder, then his lifeless eyes stared up at the rotted ceiling. W.H., why did you do that? Jeremiah screamed, inching his way back from his friend's body with the ear still stuck to his shirt. The blood kept it there. It would have been funny if I wasn't hell-bent on killing him, too. It wasn't as satisfying as bathing in blood, but it was damn close. Because I don't trust you. I bent to my knees, crouching down, holding the dagger up for him to see. Now. You're going to tell me what Kristoff plans to do. Right. Yes. Yes, I will. Elias. Maria's voice sounded like it was coming from far away. I glanced up at her and recoiled at her chalk-white skin. She was all but drained of energy from controlling the warlocks. I pulled Jeremiah up by his shirt collar and held his chin in my hand, turning his head. Look at him. See what I just did. Make it fast. Tomorrow night. He's performing the ritual tomorrow night, and please don't kill me. At the hotel. Yes. Okay. When he saw the blade descending, he drew in his breath to scream again. I was too fast for him, plunging the dagger into his throat up to the hilt and pulling it out as I backed away. He gagged, eyes bulging as his life seeped away. I licked my lips, almost faint with desire. Just a little taste. Elias. Her voice was a whisper. She swayed back and forth before sinking to the floor. I caught her just before she made contact. Her head lolled back on her shoulders, eyes closed. I shook her, but she didn't flinch. She was out. Chapter 12 Maria He was the first thing I saw when my eyes fluttered open. His face filled my world. I couldn't see anything else but him, and the way his eyes darted back and forth over my face. Elias? I whispered. Things started clearing up. I felt softness underneath me instead of the cold, filthy warehouse floor. Where are we? Your apartment, he whispered back. How? I glanced around. Sure enough, I was on the bed. I wiggled my toes. My boots were still on. I was still dressed. How did we get back here? You'd be surprised how unsurprised the cabbie was when he found me carrying a girl's inert body over my shoulder. What? I tried to sit up and my head spun. He eased me back down. Relax. And yes, that was my only option. To pretend you'd overdone it. I carried you back to a more civilized part of town before hailing a taxi. His voice was softer, gentler than I had ever heard it. Not at all the voice I remembered from back in the warehouse. He might think I drugged you, but he didn't seem to care. Oh. That's extremely reassuring. He was smiling. He was actually smiling. I used to think he couldn't be any more handsome. The memory of what I had just witnessed flashed across my memory, and my smile faded. I didn't know he could be that vicious. Granted, I had wanted to do it too. Maybe I was even a little jealous that he got to be the one to make them pay for what they did. Just the fact that they spent time with Kristoff meant they were bad, bad men. Elias sighed. Are you all right after what you saw? For a moment, I thought the strain of watching me work was what caused you to faint. I tilted my head to the side. I can handle the sight of blood. Even a few, random ears, I added with a grimace. That part had made my stomach churn, even when I was only half present and half absorbed in controlling the two warlocks. I didn't realize how it would drain me, was all. I feel much better now. You're sure? 
His forehead creased as he searched my face again, looking for the truth. The fact that he cared so much did a lot to ease the discomfort over the torture I had watched. But it didn't do enough. That was unsettling back there. He nodded. I thought it would be for you. But not for you. I don't feel anything but glad that they're both dead. They didn't deserve to live. I'm not disagreeing with you. I was in their heads and I saw what was in there. It was terrible. Images flashed past me, the way they laughed as a woman screamed. Vanessa, maybe? No, it was too long ago. Somewhere far in the past. They watched while she was tortured to death. I couldn't see her, but I could feel her agony. Yes, they had deserved everything he gave them and more. It was watching him do it that unsettled me. What bothered you then? My heart sank. He was so dense. You were like a different person in there. I didn't know you had that in you, I guess I must have on some level since I know who you are and what that means. And I saw you earlier when you wanted blood. His eyes had gotten that same look in them too. Bloodlust. I shivered. I can't help how I am, he murmured, looking out the window. The rain had finally stopped and the sky was clearing up. The little bit of light coming in from outside framed his strong profile. My heart clenched. He would never understand. I know that. I'm not saying you're bad. Just that I'm not used to seeing you that way. That's all. It's the strangest thing, he said, shaking his head. When you fainted, and I caught you and I looked down at you and thought it might be my fault for making you do it. I felt guilty. I haven't felt guilt in a long time. A little for letting Vanessa get away from me, but nothing like what the sight of you did to me back at the warehouse. I couldn't breathe. Was he saying what I thought he was saying? It sounded like he was, but I was afraid to believe it. It would only hurt worse when I found out I was wrong. He was clueless. He didn't feel emotions the way I did. He had no idea. I had been in love with him from the moment my sister woke him up. I tried to smile. You didn't need to feel that way. As I said, I'm all right. It wasn't your fault. That doesn't change what I went through. How concerned I was for you. He looked down at me, and I stopped breathing again. I haven't felt that way since, for a long time. And when I did, it was because I had made a mistake. A mistake? He nodded slowly. I grew too close to my charge back then. We aren't supposed to ever grow too close to those we guard. Our lives must be completely separate. I couldn't help but blur the lines. She was, she was special. When he reached out to tuck a stray bit of hair behind my ear, I was sure my heart would explode. It was so tender and sweet. Everything I had ever imagined, and I had spent more time than I would ever admit imagining what it would be like if he touched me that way. The simplest, most innocent gesture, but it meant the world. I think I've made another mistake, he whispered, then cracked a slight smile. But I don't feel like it's a mistake right now. I don't feel like it is either, I admitted. It couldn't be happening. It was all too perfect. That didn't stop him from leaning down and taking my face in his hands. I held my breath as Elias lowered his head. My mind was an empty slate, and the only thing I could think of was this incredible man that I had an unnerving attraction for. His closeness eclipsed all logic. His lips hovered over mine, sharing air with me, drawing in my scent while I breathed again and took his into my nostrils, then deep into my lungs, into my being. With one final glance at his smoldering eyes, I lowered my lids and let myself sink into the moment. His breath was warm and like cinnamon, and like a warm blanket. My attraction pulled me closer to him, starting at my core and extending outward as I subconsciously leaned toward his hard body. A sensation I was unfamiliar with sent a surge of heat throughout. I'd never felt this kind of desire before. Yes, desire. For Elias. A craving that obscured all other desires I'd ever thought I'd felt before. Those were nothing. I should pull away. 
I should push him away. I should run in the opposite direction, away from something this powerful. And then, just as quickly, something within me pushed that thought aside. My throat grew dry with anticipation for his kiss. I licked my lips but couldn't moisten them. What is he waiting for? What? I whispered. What do you want? His voice was a low, husky growl. I. I. I couldn't tell him what I wanted. I shook my head slightly. Can't tell me. Can't say it. That low, throaty voice of his again. His breath teasing. Then show me, he demanded in that same seductive tone that made me melt inside. I leaned in closer, my body against his as I brushed my lips to his. He groaned. My arms wrapped around his neck. I tasted his mouth, caressed his lips with my tongue while he remained still, icy blue eyes locked with mine. His tongue captured mine, tempting, teasing, demanding, claiming. He licked my bottom lip, then took it between his teeth and sucked, then bit down, sucking and biting intermittently while I ached for him, jolts of desire making my body clench and unclench, wrenching a whimper from my lips. Elias pulsed through my blood as surely as my feelings for him pulsed through my heart. With a final kiss he raised his head, his eyes locked on mine. I needed to know. I exhaled slowly. It'll be dawn soon, he murmured as he looked out the window. And we have to get out to Atlantic City. I know. I can't imagine what we'll find there. The magic of the last few minutes was gone. I had never gone through an entire range of such extreme emotion in such a short time. I could still almost feel his lips on mine, my body quivered and pulsed with desire for him, but my mood had already gone dark. Is it wrong? What we feel? He turned to me with one eyebrow raised, and my heart skipped a beat. With the early morning light on his face, he was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Isn't it a little late for second thoughts? I shook my head. Not what we feel but that it's now while Vanessa is still out there with Kristoff. It feels disloyal. He came back to me and sat down, then pulled me into his embrace. I closed my eyes and let myself sink into it. You've been nothing but loyal your entire life, he murmured. I saw you exhaust yourself to the point of unconsciousness to help me question those two last night. You put yourself in jeopardy for her. You've done nothing but sacrifice for years. He pulled back, brushing my hair away from my face with a rueful smile on his. The timing is what it is. I'll grant you that. But if it wasn't for this madness, I wouldn't have discovered who you are. What about the rules of the fold? What would they think about this? I closed my eyes as he kissed my forehead, my cheeks the tip of my nose. We don't have to think about that right now, he reminded me in a soft, seductive murmur. But we do. I pulled away with a groan. Please. You don't know how much I've wanted this to happen. It's like something out of a dream, the best dream I ever had. I don't want to break it up. But my heart is too heavy. When this is over, when we find my sister, what happens? Realistically. He sighed. Realistically. This could only go one of two ways. Either we find your sister alive and unharmed, and life goes on the way it was before, with me living as I do and you living as you do. Or, I asked with a sinking heart. He stroked my cheek with the back of his fingers. Or it's already too late by the time we find her. Then I go back to the fold, and another high sorceress wakes me up in a hundred years, once your sister's blood has fully left my system. Tears filled my eyes. I would be alive still then, if luck was on my side. But I would be old, too old. He would still be young, handsome, vital. And imprinted on another witch. Not me. Never me. It all seems so pointless, I choked out. He took my hands in his. Maybe this is all there is then. Right now. We're not human. We don't get the happily ever after, fairy tale ending. We take what we can while we can, and right now I want you. I don't want to waste a minute of this time together. And so I gave in to his kiss, because there was no way to argue with that logic. 
and I didn't want to. I wanted him for as long as I could have him, because I might have to live on the memories for another hundred years. Chapter 13 Elias I shook my head in disbelief. This is all so different. I can't stop noticing all the differences. All the concrete, all the boxy buildings where there used to be farms. Maria snorted from her seat behind the wheel of the car. I can't imagine. It's one thing to live through a lot of changes, but going to sleep with the world looking one way and waking up to something so different must be tough to process. Tough. It's damn near impossible. When I first saw the jet plane that would take us from the cells back to New York, I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe any of it. I was wondering about that at the time. As we left the fold. Well first, I worried about the raw protection. Whether the spell worked. If you would be all right in the sunlight. I looked down at my hands, where the sunlight beat down on them through the car windows. It's still holding up, I murmured. That's a relief. I had worried about that, when the bloodlust took you, I mean. Not being close to Vanessa, the spell's power lessening. I hoped that wouldn't be the case with every spell she cast that day. It doesn't seem to be. The sun didn't affect me any more than it normally would. I felt a tingling sensation, but it was almost pleasant. Nothing like what would normally happen to a vampire in the sun. I had watched one of my brethren suffer the agony of burning to death, screaming, shrieking, begging for help while his skin bubbled in seething blisters before turning black and flaking off, revealing the flesh beneath. Just that one incident was enough to make me a believer in the power of the raw protection spell used by the witches after our kind were signed into their service. It was even named after the ancient Egyptian sun god. I wondered if it had been around since those times. The car was comfortable, though still not as flashy or luxurious as the car Vanessa used. And Maria drove herself. Just another difference. I ran my hand over the leather seat. Why do you drive yourself when none of the other members of your coven do? She raised a brow. You're familiar with the rest of the coven? I've been to enough coven gatherings to know what I know. I've seen other members arriving in their cars, always driven by others in their service. She shrugged. I've never enjoyed that. Being doted on. I would rather take care of myself. Is that why you spend so much of your time in the city? Her fingers tapped along the outside of the steering wheel while her teeth dug into her bottom lip. Most people live in the city and take their weekends or free time out in the country. I do the opposite. The city is where I go to clear my head and think rationally. I wish I could explain the feeling of not fitting into the life those like you are living. Something like that. Yes. Vanessa is the same, one of the few ways in which we think alike, she chuckled. She doesn't believe in going with the flow for the sake of pleasing others. She wanted to live in the city full-time even after the coven named her High Sorceress, and you can just imagine how my mother reacted to that. I chuckled humorlessly. Yes. I can. But Vanessa got her way, like she always does. Her hands tightened on the wheel. I hope we're in time to help her. Well, if it's any consolation, I don't think raw protection would be working if she were, you know. I didn't want to say the word. I had never shied away from talking about death before. I had murdered two men the night before. But even implying that her sister might die was uncomfortable. That was what opening myself up to feeling something for her did to me. That's true. She glanced at me with a quick smile before turning her attention back to the road. Thank you for that reminder. We were silent for a while, but that didn't mean my mind wasn't racing in all directions at once. I hoped I had everything I would need to face whatever we were going up against. Christoph had probably learned a few tricks in the last century while I was in stasis. Did anything happen while I was in stasis, before Vanessa woke me, that might be attributed to Christoph? Anything suspicious? 
Disappearances, strange phenomena. She shook her head. Nothing that I'm aware of. As if on cue, her phone rang. Since it was connected somehow to the car's computer system, the sound filled the closed car. There was a small screen between us which flashed the word mother. Technology was a miraculous thing. Maria touched the screen to answer. Hello? Maria. Cressida's voice crackled with anxiety. You can't let this much time pass without at least keeping me updated on what you're doing. Maria rolled her eyes but also blushed. You're right. I'm sorry. Everything is all right. Cressida let out a barking laugh. All right. I'll believe that when I have both of my daughters back in one piece. All right as far as it can be at the moment, Maria amended. Frustration knit her eyebrows together. You know what I mean. We're on our way to where we believe Kristoff is currently in hiding. What? I winced at Cressida's piercing shriek. Mother, please. You're on speakerphone and I'm in the car. I don't care where you are. Is Elias with you? Of course, I said. How could you let her do anything this dangerous? Mother, he's not letting me do anything, Maria reminded her, sounding testy. The energy in the car changed. The air almost crackled. Vanessa reacted that way sometimes when she reached the end of her patience, though it seemed to take Maria much longer to reach that point. I had witnessed Vanessa filling a room with lightning when she didn't get her way, standing in the center as bolts ran through her and danced along the walls and ceiling. He should know better. He is sitting right here in the car with me, and I don't appreciate you talking about him like he isn't. I don't appreciate you talking to me this way at all. I'm an adult, and I'm going to bring the High Sorceress home with Elias's help. Or he'll do it with my help more likely. She smirked, looking over at me. Cressida fell silent for a moment. All we could hear was her breathing into the phone. Her voice was softer when she said, I couldn't bear it if I lost both of you. I wish you would tell me where you're going, we could all meet you there. The entire coven. There's no way Kristoff could defeat all of us. I touched Maria's leg to signal quiet. With all due respect, guarding Vanessa is my duty. I would be doing this on my own if your daughter hadn't insisted on looking for her along with me. At the time, I had no idea how dangerous the situation was. If I had, I wouldn't have allowed it. I would much rather do this on my own, as it should be. Cressida sighed. Just because your kind has been conscripted to guard us doesn't mean you have to take outrageous risks. That was as kind as she would ever be toward me, I could tell. Even so, asking the rest of the coven to join us would be terribly foolish. I believe we can get Vanessa out of there. Between her and Maria, I have two powerful witches on my side. Any assistance you can send from where you are would help, Mother, Maria reminded her. Any spells the coven could cast to protect us. I'll do that, she said, and she sounded much more like herself in command of the situation. Cressida needed to feel needed. When the call ended, Maria asked, Why do you do what you do? When my mother mentioned you're being conscripted to this life, I realized that I had never asked. Not once. Ever. Even though your mother. Yes, even though my mother had a night warden of her own, she said with a sad smile. Isn't it funny, the things you take for granted when they've always been the way things are? I never thought to ask why. I even watched the ritual from outside your cell, but I never thought to ask why it had to be someone in the fold specifically. It happened around the time I was first turned, more than. I exhaled. More than a few hundred years ago, I explained. In Serbia. What's now known as Serbia, yes. Life was different for those of my kind back then. We were the hunters, the beasts who only roamed by night. Looked on as little more than animals. At the time, there was nothing more than faint civility between us and the covens who resided in the forests and mountains. We stayed out of each other's way, for the most part. Except for the leader of my clan, 
if you could call it a clan. Our sire. He created us, protected us. And he made a big mistake one night while out hunting. What? She was completely enthralled with my story. I could hear it in how breathless she was. He killed the daughter of a high sorceress. Oh no. Oh yes. It was a grim time, I said, shaking my head at the memory. The sorceress was ready to kill all of us in retaliation. The only thing that stopped her was an idea to keep herself safe and any high sorceresses who came after her. The vampires our sire had created were to serve as night wardens for one thousand years. That long, she gasped. What if you refused? She would kill our sire, who she imprisoned. When he dies, we die. We're all connected. It's some sort of spell. The original coven came to America and split off into two. That much I know, she said. Right. But since those covens both originated from the first, we have to serve both. And any other that are spawned or split off from the original. She shook her head. I don't think I ever really understood until now that you're, she paused, then cleared her throat. You're more or less a slave. That's a very strong word, I muttered, though I had used it myself many times. It's true. This is the way things have to be for a few centuries more. There's nothing we can do about it. And I'm hopeful she keeps her word, and we only have to spend a thousand years. An uneasy silence settled over the car as we both understood the truth to that statement. There was nothing we could do to be together. Chapter 14 Maria It was always interesting to me how humans looked right through things they didn't feel like noticing. Like the hotel at the end of the beach, where it loomed over the rocky shore like a castle in some old horror movie. If lightning had zigzagged out of a clear blue sky and struck one of the many pointed roofs, I wouldn't have been surprised. It would have completed the look. How is it still standing? Compared to the shining casinos with their blinking lights, the hotel was an eyesore. Not that I thought the more modern buildings were beautiful. They looked cheap and fake and me, the way a lot of architecture did from this time, but they at least looked as though a person would live through a trip inside. It had once been a crown jewel, that much was obvious. It was built with all the grandeur of its time, a rambling monster with a parapet at all four corners and thirty floors, by my rough estimate. But it was falling apart. Most of the windows were boarded, and those that weren't let the salt air blow through. There wasn't a pane of glass left in any of them. The outer facade had probably been a beautiful white, and I could just imagine the hotel shining like a diamond. No, not a hotel. More like a resort. How many rich, famous, gorgeous people had been through those doors? They were probably all as rotten by then, too. The salt spray had turned the walls gray, cracked and broken. Plaster had come off in big chunks, revealing the slats underneath. I was blocks away, still sitting in the car, but I could almost hear the walls creaking and groaning. Elias was appraising it, too. It's like the old beauty where the coven meets, he muttered. Humans only see what they want to and ignore the rest. I'm sure they think about this place every once in a while and wonder why it's still standing, but they don't do anything about it. I'm sure Kristoff had something to do with it, I reminded him. The way we do. Making sure the building fades into the background. While he does his dirty business inside. His voice was a nasty growl. I pulled my eyes from the hotel where my sister was imprisoned. How would we find her in all those rooms, to look at him? How do you want to do this? I asked. As quickly as possible. I snorted despite the almost painful tension. Be serious. I am. He shifted his strong body until he was facing me and took my hands. His were slightly cold, as always, but the blood pumping hard and fast through my veins would probably heat them. I need you to understand what we're going up against in there. You've never seen Kristoff for yourself. You have? I stared. You never said. It never came up, he pointed out. Yes, I've seen him. 
I've been face to face with him, and I can tell you he's beyond humanity. There's nothing left of anything resembling kindness or empathy. I want you to be prepared for what you might find. You have me picturing sacrifice rooms lined with bones, said with a nervous laugh. You might not be too far off. I gulped, suddenly nauseated. We have to hurry, I said, ready to turn and get out of the car and run straight to the crumbling hotel. But Elias held me firmly in place. That's what he'll expect, for us to be in such a panic that we won't think before rushing to her rescue. He takes pride in his intelligence as well as his heartlessness. He'll stop at nothing to have what he wants. I understand that. Why were we wasting time? If he remembers me and sees there's anything between the two of us, he'll use you against me. I'm sure of that. How can you be so sure? Because he's done it before. His expression hardened, and all the tenderness in his eyes turned to bitterness. To you. He nodded slowly. Do you remember your mother talking about the witch I lost? Yes, they burned her at the stake. That wasn't who Cressida was referring to. His eyes shifted up over my shoulder, staring into the past. He didn't kill her outright. Charlotte. He wasn't able to get close enough to her. I made sure of that, and he knew he was outmatched between my skills and Charlotte's abilities to defend herself. But he managed one last spell before he disappeared. His voice was flat, but I could still hear the pain in it. Pain he had carried for so long. What did he do? He made her sick. We didn't know it at first. It took weeks to develop, and there was nothing to be done about it. Trust me, the coven tried everything. Even conventional human medicine. What did she have? Consumption, or rather tuberculosis. It ravaged her. I never left her side over the course of it, and by the end she died in my arms. Coughing up blood. Choking on it. To this day, I can't get over the twisted nature of it. Making her choke on her blood when he knew I needed that blood to keep our connection, to stay alive. I had to rely on animal blood to feed on, because her blood was tainted. But that did nothing for our connection. I felt everything she felt. He probably knew that, too. He's pure evil. You loved her, I whispered. I did. Then. And I let her die. That wasn't your fault. You might be surprised, but there are many others who don't share that opinion. I let him get close enough to her to hurt her. Had I been smarter, had I known exactly who I was dealing with, things would have turned out differently. I only thought he was vicious and animal. I didn't know at the time that he was deliberately cruel, too. I'm sorry for all of that. I didn't know what else to say, but I felt like I had to say something or else seem uncaring. You see why I'm worried then? Because if he senses a connection, he'll want to use it. So if I'm in trouble, you need to promise you won't try to help me. That's impossible. I can't promise that. You have to or you won't come in with me. You can't stop me. I have ways of subduing you and keeping you restrained. I winked. Don't get me excited just before we're about to do something so important. His eyes narrowed as he frowned. Maria, this is serious. I grew serious. You have another thing coming if you think I'll let you go in alone. I can throw a spell at you faster than you can do anything to subdue me. As for acting like there's nothing between us. I can do my best, if the alternative is you leaving me locked in the trunk. He sighed. It doesn't look like I have much of a choice, either. You're extremely perceptive. And I love you. His eyes widened. He was just as surprised as I was. I didn't mean for it to come out like that. Once it did, everything spilled out. Maybe I was afraid of never getting a second chance. I've been in love with you since the minute Vanessa woke you in your cell. I stood outside and watched the ritual, and I hated her guts. I honestly hated my sister because you would be her night warden. And she would never appreciate you, 
because she never appreciated anything. And now I might lose you, because we have to get her out of there. And I don't know how I feel about that. Tears filled my eyes and my chin quivered. I'm a terrible person, aren't I? Because I feel like this. His face fell as he touched my cheek, my hair. No. You're not terrible. But just think, we never would have found each other, either. And there would always be an obstacle in our way. I could only be around you, as long as Vanessa was high sorceress. That wouldn't last forever. I smiled. Not true. Remember, she's never leaving the position. He winced. I forgot. Lucky me. I laughed softly, leaning my head against his palm. She's a challenge. But I love her. I know. He looked out through the windshield, toward the hotel. Which is why we need to get her out of there. I did everything I could to hide the way my heart was breaking. We were slipping away, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Let's go then, I agreed in a choked whisper. There's just one more thing. What's that? He leaned in until we were almost nose to nose, and took my face in his hands, burying his fingers in my hair. I love you. Chapter 15 Elias You're sure the spell is working? I asked as we walked hand in hand down the cracked, crumbling sidewalk. The entire lot surrounding the hotel was in shambles, overgrown and forgotten. Broken glass sparkled like glitter under the sun. I scanned the scene, eyes sweeping back and forth over everything for signs of movement. I'm sure of it. Just don't let go of my hand, or you'll seem to appear out of thin air to others. Her voice was tight from the effort of keeping us invisible as we approached. Do you feel her? Is she in there? I haven't felt her since she disappeared, I admitted, looking at the boarded windows and wondering which one she was behind. There were so many. There must be an enchantment, something he cast over the property so I wouldn't be able to sense her. That makes sense. I can feel the energy. Can't you? I could. Like a cloud surrounding the grounds. Layer after layer of protection against the rest of the world. It's there, I agreed. Will we be able to get through? We will. She didn't elaborate. I didn't want to risk breaking her concentration, so I left it up to her. I needed to concentrate on what we would find once we were inside anyway. How many did he have with him? What were they capable of? I didn't doubt Maria could handle herself, no matter how many of them came our way, and I would gladly rip apart anybody who decided to test their luck with me. It had been a long time since I had the pleasure of killing somebody who really deserved it. The two in the warehouse had only served to whet my appetite. We made it down the pathway to the wide double doors, sidestepping the weeds that grew through the cracked cement as tall as young trees. She squeezed my hand. If I'm going to get us inside, I have to stop focusing on invisibility and start working infiltration. So, we became visible. Maria dropped my hand and lifted both of hers. The fog around the hotel felt a little thinner, like a veil was lifting or wind was blowing things out of the way. The energy lessened, felt less intense than it did while we were walking up the sidewalk. Okay. Let's go in. She looked at me, and the thing that stood out most was the complete lack of fear in her eyes. They were like steel. Completely determined. I had never loved anyone or anything in my long life, as I loved her at that moment. We stepped into one of the more depressing, chilling scenes I had ever witnessed. The lobby floor was covered in dead animals, raccoons, squirrels, birds, rats. The occasional dog or cat. They had wandered in through the open doors and found their end, but not through natural causes. A dog with its head turned backward hadn't died naturally. A cat with no eyes, its jaw broken and hanging open. Some of them looked like they had killed each other, covered in blood and deep gashes sometimes with their throats torn out. I wondered if somebody inside the hotel found it funny to force animals into fights to the death. It wasn't even surprising. Rage built within me. 
Maria let out a sound of mixed dismay and disgust when she took in everything. She had never seen what he was capable of. She didn't know, it was one thing to be told but another to see it for herself. Only that was the tip of the iceberg. Focus on what we're doing here, I muttered even though my stomach turned when I almost stepped on a dog's carcass. Even without the wall-to-wall -wall animals, the lobby would have been a depressing sight. It used to be beautiful. I could see that much for myself. The marble was pitted and cracked, but it had probably shown at one time. The wide sweeping staircase that could have easily fit twelve men standing abreast was full of more animals and corners stuffed with rat shit, its banisters rotting and broken. The place reeked of piss and death. I told myself to follow the advice I had just given Maria and concentrate on finding Vanessa. Can you feel her? she whispered. No, and it unsettled me terribly. But he probably still has a spell on her. Something to block me from picking up on her. Right. She looked at me. What about blocking her from picking up on you? I winced. Yes, Kristoff had to know we were there. Where should we look first? she murmured. I pointed. There was a pathway through the animal bodies. It led through the lobby and down the hall to a closed pair of doors. It's as good a place to start as any, I whispered. It's a high traffic spot at least. All right. You're ready for this? she asked. As ready as I can be. The dagger seemed to burn on my hip, and my hunting knives and other thin-bladed daggers hung from the inside pockets of my coat. They were as ready as I was. My fangs ached to emerge. We reached the doors and each took one handle. One, two, three. We pushed in unison and entered what turned out to be a ballroom. Or what used to be a ballroom. It had turned into something much like the lobby, but without the dead animals. That was a step up at least. It didn't quite burn the inside of my nose. Yes, a ballroom. That would appeal to Kristoff's sense of drama. The room looked empty, however, and out of use. Marble columns dotted it, stretching up to ceilings so high I couldn't make them out of the shadows. We walked side by side into the center. Ah! Our guests have finally arrived. I touched Maria's arm to keep her silent, as my eyes followed the sound of the cold nasty voice. It carried throughout the ballroom, as did his slow measured claps. We've been waiting for you, the voice announced. I was afraid you wouldn't make it in time for the show to start. Don't move, I whispered, barely moving my lips. He was somewhere near the front of the room, maybe somewhere on the dark bandstand. It hadn't seen a band in a long time, but that wasn't the entertainment Kristoff had in mind. And he wasn't alone. It wasn't just Vanessa I scanned the ballroom for. There had to be others like the ones I'd already killed, Warlocks who had glommed onto Kristoff because they were too weak or stupid to make it on their own. Where were they? He would sick them on us first to tire me out, and to give me a false sense of triumph when I killed them. Then he would attack. I thought I saw movement in the shadows to my left. Nine o'clock, I muttered. Maria didn't make a sound, instead she threw her left arm straight out and a ball of flame shot from it, hitting the wall. It didn't burn, but it did cast enough light to reveal three warlocks crouched in what used to be inky darkness. They had no choice but to rush us once we knew they were there. Incapacitate. I bellowed as I ran to them, out of the path of the spell Maria was about to cast. A bright blue light surrounded the men and froze them in place. They were too slow to begin with. I reached inside my trench and pulled out two hunting knives, throwing them into the chests of two of the three and dropping them to the floor. I spun in a circle, holding my dagger at shoulder height, slicing into the throat of the third warlock in one smooth movement before looking to the opposite side of the room where several others charged at her. Behind you. I threw another knife which caught the chest of one of them and dropped him on the spot, but there were three more coming. Maria spun in place and hit them with another ball of flame, but this one consumed all three and left them writhing and screaming as their flesh melted like wax. We stood back to back, turning in a full circle at the ready. 
The screaming faded into the background of my thoughts. Where was Kristoff? Where was Vanessa? Vanessa was the crown jewel, and he would want to keep her for last, as something to taunt us with. The light from the fire showed off more of the room, the mile-high ceiling, the rusted old chandeliers draped in cobwebs and thick with decades of dust. The windows high up on the walls must have been beautiful once, like the draperies hanging from them, but the windows were broken, and the draperies were faded and shredded and probably full of bats and insects. The perfect place for Kristoff to do his deeds. A hotel full of death. Come out and show yourself. I roared. What are you afraid of? Silence. Then, certainly not you. Where was he? I swiveled back and forth, eyes scanning, but I couldn't see him. Maybe you should be, I called out. We just took out seven of your bootlickers, and we're not even breathing heavy. That's not counting the two I slaughtered last night. A beat passed. Two. Last night? Jeremiah was one of them. The other one didn't get the chance to give me his name. A shame. They were enthusiastic to get on with the ritual, Kristoff said. He was clearly on the dark stage somewhere. Where is she? I called out. Nobody else came at us from the shadows. Was that it? Did he not have a larger army than that? Vanessa. My honored guest. She's right here. A spotlight, clearly controlled by magic, shone down on the stage and illuminated a large wooden X with a woman shackled at her wrists and feet. She raised her head and looked out at us. Maria's breath caught. Focus, I growled, even as I couldn't help but notice how torn and dirty her knee-length silk nightgown was. What had they done to her? Relax. It was as if Kristoff read my mind. I've made sure she stays clean, meaning none of my men were allowed to touch her. These last two days have cleansed her. Pain has a cleansing effect. What does that mean? Maria asked. I wished she hadn't said a word. Who's this? Kristoff stepped out and some of the light fell on him. He hadn't aged a day, his dark magic worked well. His hair was still supernaturally white, slicked back away from his smooth high forehead. His eyes reminded me of obsidian, even from far away they burned into me. Then into Maria. He strode across the stage like he owned it. Oh. You look just like your sister. You must be Maria. I've heard a lot about you. I can't imagine why, she said. I sensed the tension coming from her, she was wound tight, ready to spring. You're the less talented sister of the Chosen One, he sneered. I suppose that isn't easy for you to hear. She shrugged. Wouldn't be the first time. His brows knitted together when he frowned. He enjoyed playing mind games, finding weaknesses and exploiting them. I could have told him Maria wouldn't be that easy. I'm glad you two could make it, he said, bouncing back. It's always better to have an audience for something like this. His heels clicked against the wood planks as he walked back to where Vanessa waited. You'll be able to perform your ritual without your friends here to help you? I asked arm spread. You seem lonely now. I don't need anyone but myself. I never have. He touched one of Vanessa's long curls. I remembered how she had curled her hair for the coven meeting, and how frustrated I was with her stalling. Now it was lank and dirty. She flinched away from him. He snickered. You need no one but yourself, yet you've been repeating this ridiculous ritual again and again for decades. What? Afraid you won't be able to cast a spell without stealing another witch's powers? I took a step forward, placing myself in front of Maria. It was a mistake. There I was, thinking she would give us away, when my instincts were what did it. Kristoff's unsettlingly unlined face broke into a smile. Ah. I see. Why bring her if you didn't want me to kill her? You won't get the chance. I withdrew my dagger. He was too fast. He raised one hand, and the dagger flew from mine, skittering across the floor. Maria let out a superhuman cry and flung back a spell of her own, knocking Kristoff back, 
but not off his feet. Still, he looked shocked as he brushed off his black robes. Instead of turning his attention to her, he raised his hand and pointed to the chandelier hanging over her head. Watch out. I sprinted across the room to where she stood and threw myself against her. The heavy iron light fixture smashed into the floor, sending dust and debris flying in all directions, but we had just slid behind a marble column before it hit. Are you all right? I held her face in my hands. She was smudged with dust but looked unharmed. I'm fine. You. We both peered around the side of the column. Kristoff waited for us on the stage. Giving up so soon? But the sun has barely gone down. We still have time before the ritual begins. I looked up through one of the broken windows. Yes, it was getting dark. We were running out of time. Maria shook herself and seemed to center. Okay. Come on. She was back on her feet faster than I expected, and I had to scramble to keep up with her. Another blade at the ready. She really was ready, too. Kristoff didn't have time to defend himself before Maria held her hands in front of her face and unleashed two bolts of lightning. I had never seen anybody but Vanessa do that. The bolts wound themselves around Kristoff's body like chains. He screamed and writhed and cursed her, and the molding curtains hung at both sides of the stage billowed out as if a strong wind blew them. The wind did blow, too, hitting us both and almost knocking us off our feet. I made sure she stayed upright. Now, she screamed, hair blowing back from her face, eyes wide. The silver dagger gleamed in my hand, and I raised it, then pulled my arm back. No. Kristoff screamed, his own eyes wide with agonizing fear. He was at our mercy. It was time to rid the world of him. I let go of the dagger and watched it sail into the wind, wind which didn't alter its course. When it hit its mark and sank into his chest, Kristoff threw back his head and howled. I gritted my teeth against the ear-splitting sound and instinctively gathered Maria in my arms as she released him from the spell. She curled up against my chest, and I watched Kristoff explode from the inside out, starting from the point where my dagger had struck him. Clearly he didn't realize that I'd had my daggers enchanted. Then just like that the wind stopped howling, and the room went silent and dark again. Maria hesitated for a moment, before lifting her head and looking around. Is it over? she asked, looking up at me. I nodded and we ran for the stage. All that was left of Kristoff was his robes and my dagger. I picked it up and wiped it on the black velvet, then used it to cut the restraints holding Vanessa in place. Without the spells Kristoff had placed on them, it was easy to free her. She fell into my arms, exhausted, dazed. Oh, sweetheart. Maria held her head and kissed it, smoothing her hair back. We have to get out of here, I reminded her. As far away as possible. I want to get her someplace safe fast, she said. It'll take hours to get home. Vanessa's eyes opened. I'll take us there. Right now. Are you strong enough? Maria asked, searching her face. It did me good to see her frown, annoyed that her sister would question her abilities. Of course. Just touch my arm and we'll be there right away. So she did, and I closed my eyes. I never did like traveling that way, but it was better than a long drive. Chapter 16 Maria Sorry if you thought I would ever let you go once we got out of there, I murmured, rocking my sister as I held her. We were on the sofa in my apartment, just the three of us. Elias stood by the window, watching in case anybody had followed us. I strongly doubted it, but that was his job. Vanessa shook like a leaf. I had never seen her like that before like she could fall apart at any second. I held her tighter. Elias pulled a blanket from the arm of the sofa and draped it over her shoulders. I never thought you would get me out of there. Or that anyone would. Or could. I was sure it was over. Don't you know it was my job to make sure you got out of there alive, he asked. She glanced in his direction with a wry smile. Careful. You might sweep me off my feet. 
Besides, it was your job to come for me, but not to get me out. No offense, but I wasn't sure you could take him. Now you're sweeping me off my feet, he said. I had help too. She did everything. His gaze locked with mine. A warmth surrounded me fully. Comforting and embracing me, without his even touching me. Vanessa looked at me. You took an awful chance. I couldn't leave you there. You're too important to everybody, me included. I did what I could to smooth down her tangled hair. She needed a long soak in a hot tub and maybe a week of sleep. I looked around the living room, and a question hit me. Why did you bring us back here and not to your place? It was good to see her cheeks color a little, even if it from embarrassment instead of feeling better. I wanted a little bit of time to get my head together, before I go back. I know there will be so many questions, and I don't know if I want to answer them right away. I'm still trying to make sense out of a lot of it. I understand, and I can act as a sort of I don't know bodyguard for a while. If you want. She grinned. Because you won't be busy fending off questions yourself. I grimaced. Oh. Right. I'm not sure I want to relive that experience, is all. Now or ever. You're the high sorceress. Elias turned away from the window, where he had been looking out again. It's up to you how much you want to tell, or if you want to say anything at all. If you think it's important for the coven to know, that's one thing. I don't think it is, she decided. Then you just solved your problem. He gave her the briefest of smiles. But it wasn't his face I paid attention to. It was hers. The wide warm genuine smile made my heart twinge. The way her eyes lit up when he wasn't paying attention. Vanessa's in love with him. No, that wasn't possible. That couldn't be it. She was never in love, not that I knew of. And she had never held back from flaunting her personal life, so I was sure she would have spread the word if somebody special had come along. But didn't that make it even more possible that she loved him? Because she had never loved before. When I looked at it that way, the proclamation that she would never step down as high sorceress looked very different. If she never stepped down, she never had to give him up. How he couldn't feel it, because of their connection, I would never know. Maybe she tried hard to cover it up. Or he was so dense and entrenched in his rules and duties that he never noticed. She looked down at herself, the torn dirty nightgown had seen better days. Do you have anything I could wear? I can't wait to burn this thing. Of course. You should shower too. Take your time. I pulled sweats from my dresser and towels from the linen closet. When she was inside the bathroom with the shower running, I went to Elias and walked into his open arms. He nuzzled my neck, my ear, before burying his face in my hair. I kept my eyes open, so I could take in as much of him as possible, the little hairs on the nape of his neck, the slope of his shoulder, the curve of his ear. I tried to do what you made me promise, I whispered as he kissed my neck. Hum? I tried to leave you on your own in there, to make it look like there was nothing between us. I really did try. But I couldn't. I don't know if I'll ever be able to pretend. He met my mouth with his, and swept me up in the deepest, most soul-searing kiss I could imagine. My whole world was him. His mouth, his smell, his hands, his arms crushing me to his unyielding body. I gave myself over to him, heart and soul, and he cradled me against him. I love you, I gasped when the kiss was over and I could barely breathe or even stay standing. He held me up, and I rested my cheek against his chest. You're my all, he rasped in my ear. Everything in the world is in my arms right now. Everything that will ever matter to me, until the end of my life, no matter how many centuries are left. You will always be the thing that makes me whole and keeps me going. My soul will always long for yours. My chest hurt. I never knew heartache literally hurt. My arms tightened around his shoulders, and I tilted my face upward for another kiss. No way. Her words were like a bomb dropping on my head. 
Elias's arms dropped from around me, and we stood side by side while Vanessa gaped at us. I'm Wer. I looked up at him, lost for words. As always, he knew how to cut to the chase. We're in love. I love her. She leaned her back against the wall. Oh. I see. Everything flashed across her face, jealousy, sadness, resignation. I held my breath, ready to rush defend myself in case she had a temper tantrum. There was no telling how she'd react after what she had been through. The fact that she seemed to be taking it in without reacting made me nervous. It's not like it matters, I babbled to fill the silence. We know it's not possible for us to be together. He has a job to do for you, and there are rules. We understand. We couldn't stop it from happening, though. Her face was an unreadable mask. She stepped away from the wall and went back to the sofa, sitting with her hands folded in her lap, looking at the floor. After everything she had faced, we had just put the cherry on top of the sundae. He loved me and not her. She had to live with him, knowing he didn't love her. Finally, after holding my breath for what felt like hours, she looked at both of us. Then she spoke. I'm sorry for you both, she murmured, still staring at the floor. I know how strict the fold's rules are. We didn't mean to make things awkward or difficult, I whispered, chewing my lip, wondering which side she would finally fall on. Was she petty enough to report him for falling in love? He would leave her service, and neither of us would ever have him. You didn't make it awkward or difficult, she murmured, then looked up at me. What if you didn't survive tonight? My heart skipped a beat, even though I had no idea what she meant. What did you just say? I whispered. What are you talking about? Elias crouched beside her. She took a deep breath, then let it out slowly. What if I tell everybody you didn't survive? Kristoff or one of his minions, whoever they were, killed you both during the fight? I barely made it out alive. I came here first because I was confused and just wanted to get away, but I was alone the whole time. I couldn't breathe, she wasn't serious, was she? Was it possible that we could pull off such an enormous lie? I looked at Elias, hoping he would help me understand. But he was as confused as I was. It's my duty to guard you, he said slowly, like he was trying to make sense of the idea. I know. And you've done as good a job as you could, she said as she carefully and very slowly covered his hand with hers. Like she was afraid of what he'd do if she touched him. He was either too surprised to react, or he genuinely didn't mind, because his hand didn't move. Her smile was gentle and genuine. I know I was much too much, and I'm sorry. I really am. That doesn't matter now, he said and it doesn't mean I no longer want to serve as your night warden. That's not what I mean, she smiled sadly. I mean, I'm letting you off the hook. Only the three of us ever need to know you survived the fight. The fold will assign another night warden to me, and life will go on. Just like yours will. She looked at me. Together. Vanessa. I don't know what to say. She took my breath away. Who was this woman? It was like we had never met. I wondered for a second if she hadn't sustained serious injury, maybe a blow to the head. But she looked as clear as I had ever seen her, and she spoke clearly too. Just say you'll be happy. Okay? That's what I want for you. You think anybody will believe this? Elias stood and started pacing the room. The muscles in his jaw jumped. I think they'll believe anything I want them to believe. Why would I lie? For our sake? I suggested. Nobody knows about you too. Do they? No. Then it works just perfectly. For once she laughed in spite of herself. I mean, do you think anybody would jump to the conclusion that I made up a story to help somebody else? Especially since it means waiting for a new night warden, and making the trip to the fold to start imprinting. Ah, what a hassle. She rolled her eyes. He was still pacing, and he looked just as conflicted as ever. This isn't so easy for me. 
Not what I wanted to hear. Because of the fold, I said, hoping I was right. Hoping it wasn't because he didn't want me, once all the drama was over. It was one thing to tell me I was his everything when he didn't think we could be together, but another to commit himself. Of course, because of them. He didn't even realize how nervous he had made me. I glanced at Vanessa, who smiled and shrugged. For the first time, it was like we could connect on something. It only took decades. They don't need to know, she reminded him. Maria's car is still in Atlantic City. Why would she leave it there if she was still alive? Ah, my car. I'll miss that car, I murmured. She continued, if you hide well enough, they'll never find out. And they won't look for you. They'll assume my story is the truth, because why would I lie, and they'll be too busy assigning me a new night warden to consider following up. Besides, have you ever seen anyone from the fold here in the city? They're either over in Serbia or in West Virginia, way under the mountains. They don't announce themselves. I waited with bated breath to hear what he thought. He hadn't stopped moving yet. Not a good sign. When our eyes met, his were as intense as I had ever seen them. What about you? Me? You could walk away from your life? From your mother, your coven? A pang of guilt twisted my heart. Of course. How had I forgotten them? The question was enough to make me pause and take stock. What would life look like without them in it? I had never known anything else. Thanks to my mother being high sorceress, the coven had always been the center of my world. My identity. My family. I would never see any of them again. Mother will think I died, I whispered, stunned. How can I do that to her? Vanessa patted my shoulder. She'll think you died a hero. She'll be so proud of you. They all will. And if you think any of them will ever forget your name, you're wrong. I'll keep your name in their ears until the day I die. I can promise you that. I don't want to hurt her. My chin quivered as guilt almost choked me. I know you don't. Vanessa looked at Elias. I understand if this is too big a sacrifice to ask you to make, he said. He sounded stoic as always, but in his words was a deep current of sadness. He didn't want to ask me to do it, but he most definitely wanted me to do it. I got up and went to him. It's not too big a sacrifice. But uh, I'm not making it in a bubble. I know how it'll affect others, is all. And I have to learn to live with it. Hope flickered in his eyes. Does that mean you'll do it? Under one condition. Name it, he said with a smile. That you know for certain you'll be all right. I'm not the one who would face punishment if we got caught. He placed his hands on my shoulders and looked me straight in the eye. I'm certain. And as long as they think we're dead, it'll be safe. He looked over my shoulder, to where Vanessa sat. They will. I'll take care of it. She rose and went to my room. Come on. Let's get a few of your things together, not enough to raise suspicion but enough to live on for a while. She snickered but not unkindly. I know Elias is already wearing everything he owns. When we were alone, I turned to my sister. She reminded me a lot of our mother just then. Take charge, no nonsense, she knew best and would make sure everybody else knew it too. It wasn't until she had already gotten halfway through packing a suitcase for me that she noticed me staring and stopped, looking guilty. What? she asked with a grin. You don't believe I'll make good on my promise, do you? It's not that I don't. It's just that I wish I didn't feel like we're leaving you in the lurch. Maria. She stopped packing and gave me a hug. I had a lot of time to think things over while I was in that awful place. I realized I don't like a lot of the choices I've made. I was a brat. I was self-centered, spoiled, entitled. When I think back on some of the things I did and said, I don't like who I was before Christoph took me. Who knows? It might turn out to be the best thing that could have happened to all of us. You really mean that? 
I pulled away and looked closely at her. I really do. I'm finally doing something good for somebody else. And it doesn't even hurt, she smiled. But it was a sad, tired smile. She was doing her best for me, to make sure I was happy. You promise you'll get any help you need once you get home, I ordered, shaking a finger in her face. Talk to people. Tell them how you're feeling. Don't push them away. Everybody will want to help you get through this. I know. I'll do my best. She shrugged. That's all I can say. And be nice to your new night warden. I'll do my best there too. She gave me a playful shove. Now finish what I started and get moving. Bossy, I muttered, wrinkling my nose. We laughed together for the last time as sisters, and one of the few times. A shame it had to be one of the few times. Epilogue Maria and Elias I used to think I was good at adapting to new situations, but this is beyond me. And you know I'm trying. Elias shifted one of the bags of groceries on his hip, as he groaned. I laughed. It's been eight months living like a normal person, and you still haven't gotten used to it. Some things, yes. Coming and going as I please. That's different. He looked around the busy street, all the people walking around us. I don't have to be with you all the time, which is new. I don't mind it. Oh, thanks, I said with a touch of sarcasm. You know what I mean. I'd be with you all the time, every day if I could. But you have to work. Speaking of learning how to deal with things, I laughed in spite of myself. You're doing well. Yes, because I have help, don't I? I made an extremely fast and efficient executive assistant when I used my abilities to my advantage. I didn't like to do it all the time, it felt like cheating, but it helped when my boss threw a curveball at me. And when I had to pretend, I knew how to do things I had never attempted before. You'll never make a domestic out of me. Simple as that. Elias shrugged as we walked up the stairs to our apartment. Fine. I'll do the shopping on my own. I'll just use one of those little carts, or go more frequently for smaller trips so I can handle it. All right. Compromise was the cornerstone of any good relationship, I reminded myself with a wry smile. Philadelphia wasn't New York, but it was becoming home. We lived in a simple apartment filled with books. He read faster than anybody I had ever met, a side effect of never sleeping, and refused to use electronic books. He didn't trust them, and didn't care how ridiculous it sounded. So it was the three of us, me, Elias, and our library. We'd need a separate apartment soon just for them. But we were happy. It had been the best eight months of my life, even with the little bumps in the road. I had adjusted to working for a living, and he had adjusted to living with another person, instead of having a little cell of his own. He still felt Vanessa sometimes, when she felt something very strongly, but the fact that he had imprinted on me helped work her out of his system. The connection that they had was lessening every day. I found it comforting in a way, and would be sorry when she was no longer part of him. I could sort of keep up with her through her feelings, make sure she was doing all right, make sure she was still alive. The rest of it was all behind me. Behind us. There was no reason for them to look for us, and they would probably never find us in a million years. We were two needles in a haystack, with millions of other people, living a normal life together. It would have been different if Elias went hunting at night, or I tried to find or form a coven. We made it a point to fit in and make no waves. I put away the groceries while he sat down in a beaten-up easy chair by the window with a new book, one almost as big as his head. I couldn't help but smile fondly, even though I had other things in mind. His long, strong body was too good to resist, and we didn't have any other plans for the day. I'm still so stressed out over this week, I said, shaking my head, rubbing the back of my neck. Hum. He didn't look up. I almost growled. I said, I'm stressed out from all the craziness at the office. 
It's Saturday morning, and I still can't shake it. My neck is so tight, my head is achy. I feel terrible. I wish I could work this tension out somehow. Um him. He flipped a page. I closed my eyes and counted to ten before speaking again. This time I pulled my sweater up and over my head, then tossed it at him. It covered his book, he wasn't the only one with good aim. When he looked up with an expression of surprise, I said, I would love it if you would help me relieve my tension. Maybe in the bedroom? One corner of his mouth quirked up in a wicked smile. Why didn't you say so? Dense as always. It was a good thing I didn't fall in love with him, for his talent at picking up a hint. She was everything. I'd finally found her. Our laughter dissolved, and before I knew it we were kissing. It was sweet and passionate at the same time, but there was no urgency. We had all the time in the world. She was going to be my wife. My woman, forever. I hope you've enjoyed this Ava Benton book. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.